All right, Baruch Abba, welcome. We have another Shabbat Drash. I'm glad you guys could all make it. Uh, decent turnout. I think we'll have more trickle in as time goes by. As this is our second Shabbat teaching today. Bezrat Hashem, we'll be seeking for his revelation today as we all dive deeper together into Torah portion by Yetze. So he went out. And I just want to open with a real quick prayer. Avinu malkeinu modeim anachnu lefamecha tudalecha ki gam ki yesh lano tzarot vechayenu ki ata tamid imanu. We give you thanks, Father, that even though we have trouble sometimes in life, that you are always with us continually. King Nihiratzon Adonaya Avotenu, Vavote Velohe Avotenu, Ki Hayom Hose Anachmu Yochalim Lil Mold Tov Beinecha, Anachmu Rotseim Lil Mold Velevina et Kol Hadavar Asher Kakatuv Betoatecha, Ten Lamu Adonai, Ten Lamu Bavkesha et Chochmatecha. היום הזה, וגם תעזר אותי, כי אני יכול לדבר רק כי אתה רוצה. לא לנו, לא לנו הכבוד, ורק לך, וגם משיח הנך, אשר נתת לנו, ישוע. אוקיי, אז נתחיל. התורה הראשונה היום, כמו שאתם יודעים עכשיו, אתם יודעים שאתם יודעים שאתם יודעים שאתם יודעים Daniel, this morning, is Breshit, or Breshis, in the Ashkenazi pronunciation, chapter 28, verse 10, through chapter 32, verse 3. The Haftarah is Hoshia, 12, 13, through 14, verse 10. Unless you're, unless you're a strange person, Sephardim, <laughs> the Spanish Jews, or the Jews from Arabia, they will be reading chapters 11, verse 7, through 12, verse 12. Welcome to any newbies today, any guests. Our protocol is you can always ask questions if you type it. You have to type it on your phone or your tablet or your laptop or whatever you're, you're uh, connecting in with. You type it in the little area there. I have an eyeball on the, the chat area. And when I see a question or a comment or a spore, you know, be well, you're, you're an argument, you're welcome to disagree. Um, just don't, just keep it friendly and we'll be happy to engage and seek together. Like the Bereans, who were, of course, Jews, the Berean Jews, which is oftentimes neglected to mention. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, instead of doing, uh, I've switched gears lately, I think you guys have noticed, instead of having our Tehillim time, our Psalms time, take up an hour of class, I've reduced that, reduced that and so instead we're going to have just either the first Aliyah or part of the first Aliyah in Hebrew, so we can do our deep digging in the actual Torah text. So uh, if, if you don't read Hebrew yet, if you are Hebrew impaired, then we have several students in the Kahal, many are learning Hebrew. I advise that you ask one of them for some help, and they can point you in the right direction so you can at least learn to read. Please, 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 at least learn the Aleph Bet. It's not that hard. Um, I think my fastest student learned to read in about 47 minutes when I was working at TI. There was a Jewish fellow there who never learned to read. And, you know, 47 minutes, we used to write notes to each other, English notes with Hebrew letters, right, on the whiteboard, like making fun of the other coworkers. And so just being silly, you know, like Bill is stupid, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but you can do that. So, and then you can benefit more from our teachings because sometimes people tell me, oh, Rabbi, it's too deep, it's too deep, eh, it's so deep. Eh. Look, it's not so deep. But if you at least learn to read, even if you're slow, it's okay. If you at least learn to sound out the letters, you can benefit from, from these, this, the linguistic side of things. And bit by bit, I'm a big fan in long-term goals, right? Like, you don't have to be all crazy and say, oh, I'm going to learn Hebrew in six months and blah, blah, blah. Look, <laughs> this is not a modern language. With a modern language, it's easier, right? You just say, you have, maybe you learn 2,000 words and you can chit-chat with anybody about everything, right? And the language, it's like a snapshot of where the language is, right? Like, I'm not going to speak to you in Old English, right? Because it sounds more like German, and you wouldn't understand. But 
With biblical Hebrew, we have kind of a span that the language goes through, right? You have there's certain dialects. There's the Israelite dialect, the Judahite dialect. There's uh, you know some, there's influences from from Ugaritic and other Canaanisms that come into the language. And there's really a whole wealth of learning that you can go as deep as you want to. But if you're just going to do Torah Hebrew, that's really not too bad. It's it's really not too hard. And it's a very, very realistic goal. No matter what your age is, if you say five years from now, I want to be able to read the Torah without a dictionary and understand what I'm reading, you can do that. You can do that. You give it an hour a day, for sure you can do it. You give it 30 minutes a day, probably you can do it. You give it 15 minutes a day, then you pick your book. Maybe you want to read Genesis or Exodus or whatever. You focus in on one and master it. But nevertheless, if you at least learn the alphabet, you can follow along with us a little bit and start to get the advanced learning that's happening here. I really want you all to be blessed by this, okay? And just a little footstep at a time. And you'll look back five years from now and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I'm reading this and understanding. You'll have that joy of reading Lashon HaKodesh, the Holy Tongue and experiencing it, because really, this is the Bible. You guys have heard me mention before that I, I agree with, I sympathize, rather, I should say, with the Muslims on their perspective that if you're reading the Quran in English, well, that ain't the Quran, right? They say it must be in Arabic, because they believe that's the Holy Revelation. They're wrong, but, but the spirit of the thing is correct, right? That that's their quote-unquote holy book, and the holy book is perfect in the language in which it was revealed. For us, that's Hebrew. And so, any other language you read it in, you're not reading the Bible, you're reading, like the Muslims call an English translation of the Quran, they call it the interpretation of the Quran. And they are right on with that. So if you're reading an English Bible only, and you're not trying to see what the underlying Hebrew is, you're reading the interpretation of the Bible. Someone has taken their, their Lutheran theology and worldview, and they have probably inadvertently corrupted the text that way. Right? A lot of Bible translators, they mean well, but they're, they're stuck with the baggage of the worldview that they were force-fed in, in the seminary. So that's what I want you all to be free of. It's really my vision for this call for every single one of you to, to, to have access to, to the tools and the basic knowledge to set you free from being passengers on, on these translators' trains. All right, so let's get into our Torah portion. This is Yod, which is in... Hebrew numerals, verse 10. Again, I think it's a shame the West uses Arabic numerals. It's like, what happened? All right, so verse 10. Vayetze Yaakov mibnei shava. Okay, so yatsas, to go out. So then, this vav is a then, right? You might have learned it as and, but this is just kind of a simple gloss to say and or but. It can mean when, then, so, etc. So it's kind of like, if those of you who have studied Greek, like day in the Greek, the connected particle. So, then Yaakov went out. Yatsa means, uh, he, pardon me, Yatsa means he will go out, but this is a Vav conversa. The Vav makes it the opposite time. So, then Yaakov went out. Mi be'er shava. And you might be thinking, why is it be'er shava? Why is it not be'er sheva? Well, it is be'er sheva, but this, this is in pause. And in the ancient text, one word in each clause gets a louder pronunciation than the rest in, in ancient times. We don't read it this way anymore, but that's why it happens. And so just like each syllable in a word, there's one syllable that's more important than the others, right? That gets more stress. This one, this one, this one, this one. If you follow the ta'amin, the, the singing, the trope marks, right? They tell you which syllable is loudest. Also, in each clause, one word gets more of a pronunciation, more of a stress than the rest in the ancient times. And that caused the vowels to change. So it is Be'er Sheva, but it becomes Be'er Shava when it's in pause, we call it. So originally it would have been something like this. Yaakov Shava Okay, this one's also in pause for the second clause. So then Yaakov went out from Be'er Sheva and he Yelech and he went Harana. This hay is towards, towards Haran. Verse Yod Aleph, that's 10 plus 1, 11. Vayit gaha ba makob, vayalen, sham, kiva hashemesh, vayikach, miavne hamakohom, vayasim mirashotav. Okay. So, and 
happened in that place. So paga is like to occur, to happen, and um, sometimes it has like a military use, like to fall upon somebody, right? Like military, like to happen upon them with, with evil intent, right? But it can also just mean like to, to meet, right? So in this case, and he met in the place or reached the place. Makom means place. Vayalen, and he, this is from the verb loon. You might not recognize it's a hollow verb. Lamed, vav, noon. Loon, sometimes we see it as lean. Right? He spent the night, sham, there. Ki, because vahashemesh, the sun had arrived. Right? Meaning it's sunset. It's about to go down, right? Vayikach, me'avne. So he took from the stones of the place. That's a construct chain for you Hebrew students. The stones of the place. Vayasem, and he set and this is a weird word. The Vav at the end tells us it's his, whatever it is. So what in the world is me'ra'ashot? So this is a plural. In the root you probably recognize rosh, like head. Head, right? So it turns out that this is something on which the head has support. It, it rests itself on, right? It's head support, the head space, something like that. It's got that general concept. Oftentimes when you have a noun that's formed with a mem preformative, it expresses agency, like something that's used for something. Vaishkaf bamakom. Okay, sorry. Vaishkaf bamakom ha hu hu. And he shachav, like we say every day in the Vehafta, right? We say the Ushpochecha, right? Ufkumecha, when you lay down and when you rise up, right? Bamakom in the place ha hu. The that one, literally, in that place. And it's interesting, we keep getting this makom, makom. And I don't know if you guys remember or not, but I've, I've mentioned before that makom is also a divine epithet. So we can look and see in some places where that's used, there's a hint actually about God's ever-presentness. Right? His, like when we want to feel God in our lives, when we really want to feel a connection to him, it's proper to refer to him as hamakom, the place, right? the ever-present one. Something like that. Just like if we're asking for healing, we might pray to his epithet as as El Rafa, right? God who heals. Or if we if we really are struggling and we need substance sustenance, we might pray to him as El Shaddai, right? The God Almighty. That's usually translated because of the Greek tradition of Pantokrator, right? But really, it's like God who provides. It's related to Shad, which is a breast, like a mother's breast, right? So God who provides. You could, of course, understand him as being almighty because he's providing, right? He, the whole earth is his, right? And the fullness thereof. Verse Yod Beit, 12, 10 plus 2. Vehine he sulam mutsav alza rosho magia ha shamayma. Okay, there's our end of clause. We'll stop there because of our wishbone marker. That tells you it's the end of the the thought or the half thought. So then, chalam is a dream, is to dream, right? We know chalom is a dream and chalam is the verb. To dream a dream, uh, the Bible talks about when it's speaking of Pharaoh and Yosef, right? When Pharaoh dreams a dream. So, yachalom means he will dream, but the vav swaps the time and it makes it so that, and he dreamt. Vehine, and look, or behold, traditionally, sulam mutsav atza. Now, this is very interesting. This word, sulam, I don't know if you guys are fully used to my, the way I mark up scripture yet, but when it's hollow like this, it means it's a hapax legomemnon. That means it happens one time in the entirety of scripture, this word, right? And there's a lot of these. Many, many in Psalms, right? But to be poetic, you know, David HaMelech, he picks a specific word to make it sound nice, right? But in this case, sulam, it's oftentimes translated ladder, but that's not really what it is, right? When you go to Ace Hardware and you see the fold-out ladders, this is not what he saw. Sulam is something more like, like a step pyramid, right? Or like a series of steps going up uh, in, in the ancient world, right? And here's the definition from Halot, a series of rising rows of stones, for example, right? It might not even have been something that looks crafted, by any means to be stairs, but and actually, I kind of prefer this interpretation now that I think about it because I didn't. It's not until just now it just hit me because if you remember when Hashem gives the mitzvah for how to make the Beit Hamikdash, what does He do? He says, and also for the altar, right, the mizbeach. 
You're to use unhewn stones, right? You're not supposed to put a blade on them. They're supposed to be, it's an Evan Shelema, right? Which is a perfect stone. Shelema from Shalom, right? Evan Shelema, I mean, it's untouched. It's perfect the way that God made it through nature, not when you carve it up and make it look like some nice little cherub or something like that, right? And so I think this is probably what, quote unquote, Jacob's ladder was, right? It's something more like a series of stones. Probably they were rounded, maybe look, look like from water and air decay, erosion, something like that. And that's actually what he saw, right? It could be a step ramp. Like you see, the, you see these step ramps actually in many ancient Near Eastern cultures. So it could be something like that, like a step ramp. Or like I mentioned, like a pyramid with steps on different sides. In, in Babylon, this was very famous, this type of imagery for that the, the quote-unquote gods would come down on these sorts of things. And for visitors, when you hear me talking about the gods... Just so you know, I'm not talking about polytheism. I'm just saying that sometimes when people reach out and they try to understand these other cultures, they get certain snapshots of truth, right? They, see, they, they get some of the truth. And so it's interesting to see when there's similarities between other nations in the ancient Near the, the a &E, the ancient Near Eastern cultures, and our own. And of course, it could be a flight of steps. Maybe it was refined stairs. But you notice there's no ladder in here. It's, it's not really a ladder. If anything, it should be like... Jacob's set of stones that ascended, right? And you're going to see something else in a moment that I don't think they were stationary. So let's get into it some more. So we have mutsav. So this might be hard for you to recognize what's happening here. This verb is natsav. The noon has assimilated into the tsadi, right? It's a pay noon verb. And so verbs that start with a noon, the noon likes to disappear. And I've mentioned before, this happens in English and other languages too, right? Like the ancient, uh, the old Latin in meaning not in, plus legal, right? plus legal. So in Old English, the way that you said not legal was in legal, in legal. But over time, what happens is this noon, the English noon, he, he, what did he do? He assimilated into the English Lamed, <laughs> so that you end up actually with the word for not legal in English today is illegal with two L's, right? Or if we had dog issues, we could put a dot in there, right? There's two L's, illegal, right? So the same thing happens. It's not, sometimes people get freaked out by Hebrew morphology. Why is it so weird? It's not weird. It's, it's just the way humans do things in speech. We like to say things more easily. And so ancient Hebrew had in, pardon me, had, <laughs> would have had mun tzav. And then by the time we reach Biblical Hebrew, standard Biblical Hebrew, it becomes Mutsav. And so this tells us there's two Tzadis, just like there's two L's, okay? So, Natsav, if you guys remember, it means like to take one stand, right? It, it's, a, it's similar to Ahmad. So if you've ever been to a traditional synagogue, and Bezrat Hashem, when we have the funds, we'll have like this too. We're going to have a, a Torah a ark, and the Torah scrolls will be inside the ark. And you'll have in stone the Aser the Barot, the Ten Commandments. And above it says, Da bilifne ata omed. Know before whom you are omed standing. Okay, so that's Ahmad, right? Amud, amud a pillar. We get lots of words from this. But Natsav is a little bit different nuance. And the nuance comes from how it's used in Scripture. It does mean to stand, right? But we're told in the Mechilta, the Rabbi Yochai, that when you look, Shimon Bar Yochai, that when you look, at every place where Natsav shows up, in these places, it's often hinting about the presence of Ruach HaKodesh, right? And so, of course, this is something that, another thing that you lose when you come into English or Tagalog or Visayan or whatever, you're going to lose that, that nuance, right? It, just, it was standing, right? It was standing there. But no, there's the hint about Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit being present here, okay? Atza. Now, this is where it gets really bizarre. This is the word Eretz, which is land. But look, there's a hay at the end here, okay? This is what we call the hay locative. Like, when you're going, you're traveling towards somewhere, you put the hay locative. So if I'm saying, hey guys, let's go up to Jerusalem, I say, neilech Yerushalayma, right? I don't say Yerushalayim, I say Yerushalayma, with a hay at the end. Towards, it's like Jerusalem words, right? Like, you know that song, I want to be homeward bound, so it's like Jerusalem bound, right? Okay. Like up here, we see an Haran, by Yelech, and he went Harana, towards Haran. The text is telling us about his journey. It's not that he went to Haran, and now we're going to follow what happened. This is happening during his trip, okay? It's the process of the travel that's important. 
Same thing here. This step pyramid, or this series of rows of stones, they were stationed, hinting about the Holy Spirit, towards the ground. So when I read this, understanding if you understand Tanakhit, the grammar, it's, it's implying most that it, there's a motion going towards the ground. The rosho and its top, it's literally its rosh, its head, magia, and you might miss this, this is the verb naga, there's a noon, and the same thing happened as our in legal, the noon is inside the gimel, see the dot, it's hiding, so this is hard sometimes for students to see, what's this word? It's naga, it's hiding in there, that's why there's a dagish there, magia, so touching, naga to touch, touching, hashemaima, and look, shemaima, heaven words. So when I read this, it seems to hint to me that the thing was vibrating, right? That these stones, there's like vibrating, maybe in the spiritual realm, who knows? But like it's like moving to, to the ground, to the earth, heavens, to the ground, to the heavens. And you could see kind of a person trying to capture this in biblical Hebrew back then, having never seen it. Maybe it's like an escalator, right? You know, who knows? But trying to capture what they perceive in words or the language that they have, there's a limit, right, to what you can express. And so I think it's it's really, there's a move, there's a motion happening here. It's moving to the ground, it's moving up, it's moving to the ground, it's moving up, or vibrating, or something like that. Hey, glad to hear it's loud and clear, Nelly. Thanks for that. Vehine, malachei Elohim, olim ve'yoladim bo. Okay? So here we have a construct chain, and I will use Naomi's color choices here. In our Hebrew class, she likes to annotate construct chains with a blue square, rectangle rather. Okay, sorry, that's as straight as I can make these lines with my left hand on a, a, a laptop touchpad. Okay, so this is malachim. This is this word. This is in the construct state, which means it's angels of. You have to say of angels of God, Elohim. Now it's a little bit interesting here. It doesn't say ha Elohim, the God. It says of God. And God is not really a proper noun. But we understand from the context that we're talking about the one true God. Right? You could also interpret this as divine messengers. There were, and look, there were divine messengers, olim. This is from Allah. There's a, it's a lamed hey verb. Whenever there's a hey at the end of a verb, those of you who have been following my Aliyah Yomi, sorry, I got distracted this week and wasn't able to do, I had kind of some, a, a bunch of fires popped up. You know, I don't know, maybe it's a satan trying to keep me from it. But if you're watching the Ali Ayomi on YouTube, please uh, comment on there sometimes. If you have questions, go ahead and do that. And give me some feedback if you find it helpful, because the more of you that say that it's helpful, the more that will give me emotional juice to push forward and do it every day for you guys. <coughs> so this is Allah, to go up. Like in modern Hebrew, you might have a ma'alit, it's an elevator. Remember I said the mem, it's like an agent of the thing. So a ma'alit, it's something that helps you to go up, right? An elevator. So, which, by the way, guys, is really fun. If you study Biblical Hebrew and then you visit Israel sometimes, uh, it's fun and funny to see how modern Hebrew has, has used the ancient words in new ways. It's, it's really a delight. So you'll never be bored. You're standing in the line at a grocery store and you see some magazines there or whatever, you know, and you see how they're using the words. And sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's just like delightful to try to crack the code and see what it could mean, right? Like... You know, like the word for betach, to trust, you have this, the word for insurance is related to that. Right? So it's like you're insured, you're trusted, you, you can trust, you don't have to worry, right? So, okay, olim, going up, the yoredim, and going down. Bo, on it, or by means of it. Yod gimel, 10 plus 3. Vehine Adonai, nitzav, alav, vayomar. Ani Adonai, Elohei Avraham, Aviv, Elohei Yitzchak. Okay, so there's our end of clause. We'll stop there. Okay, the computer doesn't always keep up with me. There it goes. Okay, so and behold, and look, Adonai, we have the same verb here. You see Mutzav? This is Pu'al Binyan of the same verb. Mitzav. Adonai had taken his stand or positioned himself, right? Again, Holy Spirit, of course, Holy Spirit's there. Hashem is there. Alive, upon it, upon these series of stones that are vibrating up and down. And he said, I am Adonai. And then we have a construct chain. The God of Abraham. We have to say the God, 
because Abraham is a proper noun, and so that makes it definite. And so then the whole chain is definite. The God of Abraham. Which, which one? A positive? Avicha, your Av, your father. Now look at that, it's interesting. Abraham, your father. You note that? Abraham is not his father. This is Yaakov Avinu we're talking about. Abraham is his grandfather. So you see how, it's interesting how, from this we can learn that in the biblical mindset, in Hebrew, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your great-great-grandfather, your great-great-great-great, etc., you know, do the integral to infinity, is your father. And so when we have the mitzvah, honor your father and your mother, it means also your grandfather and your great-great-grandfather and your great-great-grandfather. So, I'm talking to the Ezrach, the native-born, and also the Ger, who's been grafted in. If you say junk about Yaakov, if you say he's a cheater or a liar or one of these other slanders about who he was, you are not honoring your father. Because if you're grafted in, then you've been adopted and he's still your father, you see? And it's not true. So it's even the worst kind of, it's Moti Shemra. Okay, so be careful. I, I want you all to be very careful. Also, if you hear some, you know, some nut job goyish pastor, you know, he's, they, she or he, they're talking about, you know, they're calling Yaakov a liar or a cheat. Or what. First of all, it's not their fault, okay? Don't be so angry with them. It's not their fault. They're trapped in a system that's been divorced from the foundation of Scripture, all right? So they just don't know any better, right? They've, been, they've inherited the wicked ways of the evil Martin Luther, right? They can't help themselves, right? The murderous Martin Luther, I should say, right? So they can't help themselves. So instead, instead of being angry, try to take them apart separately and say, hey, you know, it's actually a sin, to call Jacob a cheater and liar when really he wasn't. He wasn't. And, <laughs> and he's your father, right? So you, you have to be very careful or you're inviting a curse on your life. And if you sit there and just take it, then you are participating in Lashon Hara. Okay, so it, be very careful, Rabotai, when you, when, when you listen to this kind of speech and slander about Jacob or about Yitzhak, okay? So I'm the God of Abraham, your father, and Velohe Yitzhak, and the God of Isaac, who actually is his father. The land, and here this is probably instrumental use, like on which or by which, something like that. You have to infer that in the Hebrew syntax. Ata, you, shochev, are sleeping on, right? Again, you know this word from the Vehafta. You say twice daily. Aleha, upon it. And it's, it's her, literally upon her, because land is feminine, right? So we're, whoops, sorry, over here. So we're going back to land. Lecha, to you, et nena, I give it. U and le to za'echa, your, lecha, zera, your offspring, your seed. And let me go back here to this Adonai Nitzav. Adonai was standing and taking this place upon it. There's an interesting thing here in the Targum. And I don't expect you all to... <laughs> okay, Esau knows Aramaic, so Esau might appreciate this. But I think you'll all appreciate it. This is from the Targum Onkelos. And we talked about Onkelos before. He, he's, his translation into Aramaic of the Torah, he only translated the Torah, not the rest of the... Not the Nach. The Nach is Yonatan. And this is in the Orthodox Chumashim, right? So you have, the, you have the Hebrew text, big, like this. Like you see on my screen, it's big. And then next to it, you have real small, you have the Aramaic Targum Onkelos, right? And then below, there'll be some commentary, right? In whatever language the, that Jewish person speaks, right? So, so it's, it's interesting to see how Onkelos translates Adonai Nitzav. So here we have Hashem took his stand. Hashem is standing. But look what it says here. Vaha yekara dashem me'atad. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, so my Aramaic pronunciation is not great. But Amar, Anna Hashem, Alaheha, the Avraham Avuch, the Alahe, the Yitzhak, Ah, the At, Shechev, Allah, Lach, Eat Nina, the Leave Nach. I decided to torture Esau a bit more. I hope he's here. Did he wake up yet? Anyway, it's different time zone over there in London. So he says, Look, uh, pardon me, and then, this is ha, is like, ha, like, hine, the yekara of Hashem. So, what is yakar? What is yakar? Yakar 
well, in Hebrew, pardon me, forget the Aleph there for a second. Yakar is something like precious in Hebrew. Pre I'm like, precious, yes. So, but in Aramaic, it's the glory. So instead of saying, Adonai Nitzavaleha, Alav, pardon me, I got the Aramaic in my head this morning. It says, the glory, the kavod, the glory of, and this is Yod, Wa, Yod, that's how you do the tetragrammaton in Aramaic, of Hashem was uh, standing upon it. And then the same thing, and he said, I am Hashem, your God, God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Yitzhak, uh, the land on which you are sleeping upon it, to you I will give to you and to your, and to your children. Okay, so, but this part here is very interesting. The, the idea of the kavod of Adonai, this is oftentimes signaling to us that it's about the memra, right, the memra, that the memra is there. So we get this kind of this kind of language that's used also in sep Second Temple Jewish literature, right? Like in the um, the, the the writings of Yeshua ben Sirach, known as Sirach, right? Or or in the Book of Jubilees, you know, or in uh, uh, Wisdom of Solomon, you know. There's, there's pardon me, not Wisdom of Solomon, but there's, 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 there's uh, uh, in Enoch. So when oftentimes you'll have God's glory, His kavod, it'll do things like leap from the throne, right? It's 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 got a mind of its own, right? Or He has a mind of its own. And this oftentimes maps, other Targums will translate it directly as Memra, the word, right, the word. And so, as I've shared with you guys before, whenever we see Hashem taking on some kind of human form so that people can see Him, it's the Memra, it's the word. It's the Malach Hashem is another signal that we get, the angel of the Lord. That's, that's actually the word of the Lord is what it is. And so, this is another instance where we have, again, Nitzav, present of the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh, as we learned in the Mechilta, and then we also have, we understand, so the Ruach HaKodesh is there, and probably Hashem is there as well, as it says, and also the Yikara Dashem, the, the, the glory of Hashem, which is His Mashiach. This is what Moshe Rabbeinu saw when he said to God, he said, look, I want to see your face, I want to see your glory, and God says, look, you can't look at my face, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, I'll pass by, and when you look behind me, you can see my glory, i.e., the Memra. He's able to see the Word. He's able to see the Son in His pre-existent, uh, yeah, His pre-existent. Uh, uh, Jay, you wrote me something there. I don't really understand what you mean by that. You want to add something else? His pre-existent form. Okay. Continuing on. Where were we? Over here. Okay. To you, I give it into your offspring, right? Not to the Palestinians. Okay. Which, by the way, there's no such people group. There is no race known as Palestinian, okay? There's, there's no such thing. It's a wholly invented term. It's a great political maneuver, but the, the British, when they occupied that area, they called us Palestinians. So if you looked at a, at a Jewish, your, your birth certificate or your ID papers that the Brits would ask for, if you're Jewish, it said Palestinian. If you're Arab, it said Arab, right? What an amazing and novel thing they've done. Now that we have a state, they call themselves Palestinians, right? Because it implies native of, quote-unquote, Palestine, right? Really, they're Jordanians. Most of them are Jordanians. There's a few Druze, and there's some Egyptians. It's like a mix of different, different uh, Muslim nationalities, right? For the most part. There are some Christians, but for the most part. So uh, don't be misled by that. <laughs> it's not to the Palestinians. He's not saying this to Abraham. Look, he's speaking, right? It is to Abraham, but the promise is being narrowed now as he speaks to Yaakov Avinu. And Yaakov is not the ancestor of the Arabs. He's the ancestor of the Jews, of Israel. And so it's our offspring that Israel is our eternal gift from Hashem. Verse Yodalit, 14. Vehaya, or Vehaya hazaacha kafaharetz ufaratztaha yama vakedema Okay. So haya means it was, it was, but we have that vav in front. And what happens when the vav is in front? It it often changes the time, right? So instead of it was, it's and it will be. Oh come on. Wow. That was not what I drew. <laughs> and it will be, or and what's the it? It's zera. It's this the offspring. So za'acha. This is your zera. Your offspring will be or will become, because haya can mean to be or to become. Probably become is better. Ka'afar ha'aretz, like the dust of the land. And here we have a construct chain. I'm not going to switch to blue for now. Okay, what the heck, might as well. 
And uh, you might be wondering, you know, I'll just di diverge here for a second for you grammar nuts, uh, why it looks almost like there's a the on the first word, and you can't have a the on a word in construct state, right? Like you might be looking at this patah here and thinking, what in the world? Don't get confused. That's not a definite article marking. This is just, you can't start a word with a sh two schwas in a row, and here we have a composite schwa. And so when you do that, instead of having a schwa here, it takes on this sound here, this, and that's patah. Right, that's under there. So he just comes over here and copies them to make it easier to say. Okay, so, and because it's the land, we have to say the dust. So like the dust of the earth or the land. And you will break out yama. Here we have another hey locative, like I mentioned up above in a couple places, like we had here and we had here. Harama, artsa, yama. So yam is sea. So towards the sea, or you could also interpret this towards the west, because in ancient Israelite understanding, the sea was to our west. You know, to the east was land, right? Vakedima, and again, direction towards, <coughs> towards the east. Vetsafona, and towards the north. Vanegba, and towards the south. The Negev, right? The dry desert region of Israel. That's modern-day Judea, and also ancient Judea. Again, for those of you who are into prophecy, I've pointed out before that Safon, there's actually a place called Safon in the ancient world, right? And there's, you know, there's Baal Safon, right, who's the, the, the wicked person who came from there. And there's Hart Safon. And the Psalms talk about Hart Safon and it's, you know, it's lofty heights and all this stuff. And so it's interesting since all of these directions, they derive from actual place names except from Kedem, right? This one doesn't. Kedem can mean ancient, right? Like ancient times. It can mean to the east or like ancient times. So when you do your prophecy, if you're trying to nail down like the wicked, the evil will come from the land of the north and all these sorts of things, I recommend to you that you do not lock it down into English north, right? Don't make the direction south, but instead think from the ancient Israelite perspective. That's the key, I believe, to many of those prophecies that are misunderstood. So not necessarily from the land of the north, but from the land of Tzaphon, right? And so if you look on a map where Tzaphon oftentimes invasions from Israel came from that area, from that mountain pass, right? And so if you go up north in Israel to Nahariya, it's no longer north where Tzaphon is. You understand where, where this, of course, in modern Hebrew, yeah, it's already obfuscated and the language has been butchered and stuff. But in Tanakhit, there's these nuances about it towards the Negev, right? Towards the desert region, right? So again, if you're in the desert region already, this might not mean southwards. It might mean where you are, right? And so you understand, as you pass by, it's a phone, it's a phone, let's say it's over here, okay? And let's just say this is Israel. Uh, sorry, left hand, okay. And let's say, it's a, let's say it's a phone is like, oh, sorry, up over here. And you're here, well, that's kind of north, right? But it's not like north, here's Russia up here, like people like to do. It's this, if you're up in Naharia, that's actually not exactly north anymore, is it? And if you're down here in the Negev, well, Negba is not actually towards, you're in the Negev, right? Or towards the sea, Yama, right? Well, what if you're already, what if you're in a boat in the sea? Does it necessarily mean you've got to go more westward? Or, you see, so I think if people would be more flexible with their, with their directions when they try to interpret prophecy, we might have some breakthroughs, you know, so. And I'd be happy to hear if any of you have some breakthroughs in understanding stuff from the Nach by using these types of directions to get more of a clear sense right so yeah okay it might end up being russia that invades it could be they, they they typically do evil stuff over there you know they allied themselves with wicked chinese government slaughter of 50 million people under Mao Zedong and all this stuff so maybe but maybe not right don't be locked into it Pardon me, Uvizah, I messed that up. Uvizah, Okay, so this one, people oftentimes, they just translate, this is from Barach, to bless, right? And so they oftentimes just translate that Nifal, Nifal's oftentimes passive, and so they'll say, okay, we'll be blessed, right? They will be blessed, or it can be reflective sometimes. So, we'll bless themselves, who? Kol mispechot ha'adama. That is a nice, long construct chain. Yay, it's drawing. <laughs> the computer's keeping up with us. So, since the last word has a the, ha on it, 
the whole thing has to have the, the all of the families of the earth, right? Literally ground, but context is king, really in Hebrew. So that's the subject of this verb. So all of the families of the earth, and you could render will bless themselves, will be blessed, the cha, by means of you, instrumentally, becha, in you, okay? In you is the more literal approach, although it has other meanings as well. I'll come back to that in just a second. Uviza echa, and by means of or in your zera, your offspring, your seed, okay? Now, there's an interesting thing about this word. The Rashbam has a very, very interesting take. Please pay attention. Oh, Esau said something here I want to... Um, oh, okay, thanks. One of the guys wrote me that yakar can mean costly. Okay, nice. Right, because it's right, it's precious, right? Like a precious stone is something that's costly. Thank you, very good. Uh, Esau says, kedem could also mean old. Right, right, like ancient, right? Like yeah, we say yame kedem, the days of old, right? Uh, and can mean ahead. Oh, interesting, ahead. I did not realize that. That's a modern Hebrew thing, yeah, Esau? Very interesting. Kedema, like onward, like that, onward. Kedema. Interesting. Oh, Kedima? Is it Kedima? Interesting. I like that. Now, pay attention to this, though, guys, okay? The, the, the Rosh Bomb, yeah, I'll just pull it up for you. He, he, he says something very interesting here in the Mikrot Gedolot, okay? He says that this, he points out that this is the Nifal form, not the Pu'al. He says that the Pu'al is the passive of the P'l, to bless, right? So if, it, if we wanted to say they will bless themselves or be blessed, it should have been Pu'al instead of with this little, you see the noon here? This little noon tells us it's the Nifal Binyan. And he maintains that the Nifal Binyan actually means it's an expression of engrafting. In other words, I think it's, uh, what is it? Uh, it's, Mavrich u marbich, right? So that, that it's an expression of engrafting. In other words, the families of the earth will be intermingled with your family. I want to say that again. The families of the earth will be intermingled with your family. Wow, I didn't underline that so well, did I? Ah, nice, Isa. Thanks. Yep. I like in the Kaddish. For this is the form without the Dagesh, and I have already explained this in Parashat Lech Lecha. Okay, sorry, Rosh Bam, we didn't pick it up back then. I <laughs> should have picked it up back in Lech Lecha. But, uh, yeah, I, I want that to sink in for a second. So he's saying that we should interpret this to mean that all the families of the earth, they will be engrafted into you, which we can go with the very plain meaning of Beit then, as in, in you, and in your offspring, which is very interesting because this actually supports our theology at Simchat Hashem. Check out this from Rav Shaul in his letter to the Kahal at Rome, chapter 11, verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, he's talking to Goyim, right? Those who were born Goyim, the ethnoi in the Greek there, a wild olive were grafted in among them and have become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree. Which is what I'm always saying that some people, they use the excuse, but I'm not a Jew. You know, I don't have to do that, Torah. If you're grafted in, you do. Grafting in is conversion language. Rav Shaul, he's using very technical language, grafting in, meaning you've joined Israel. How in the world can Shaul, in one hand, call the quote-unquote kehila, the ecclesia, how can he call those guys, who some go and they say the church, how can he call them Israel if they're not grafted in, if they haven't joined us? Right? If they haven't become adopted. And he uses adoption language as well. Conversion language and adoption language. Right, So then, if you have entered into Israel, which is the kingdom, don't you have to follow the rules of the kingdom? Right? Yeah, yeah. You have to keep the rules. If you want to be a good citizen. Otherwise, as we're warned in, in the Basorat Matityahu, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, that those who break the least of the commandments of God, the least of the Torah, and teach others to break them, shall be called least in the machut elokim, in the kingdom of God. They'll be called least, the underachievers, the slackers, the greasy gracers. I got that term from, ah, oh, I can see his face right now. I like to give the credit, greasy grace, I love that. Ah, uh, what's his name? He had the uh, uh, passion for truth ministries. I can see his face right now. Recently been released from prison, Baruch Hashem, early, early. On some, he was in prison for some trumped-up financial charge. 
you know, and uh, yeah, Jim Staley. Thanks, Jim Staley. Yeah, he. I think he's really got a good seeking heart. I'm hoping that, you know, pray for him that he'll come to see a clearer truth about Torah and stop saying the name of God. Stop, stop treating God's name as if it's mundane. But a lot of good, you know, he's got a lot of good perspectives. He's someone who's figuring stuff out and that greasy gray streak. I don't know if he invented it or not, but I heard it from him one time I was at the gym working out. Oh, let's listen to this guy. <laughs> I, I like it. You know? So this is not for you, right? Those of you who have been grafted in, those of you who complete, completed the three-year cycle through the Torah, right? You've, 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 you've taken on the full armor of God. You're taking up the defense of his word. You want to be like the Memra. I was debating with someone... A couple weeks ago online, well, it wasn't just me. It's like, it's kind of a brawl. Some Hebrew Roots guys, and I was just kind of like their ally, right? You know, although usually they're debating with me, we're debating each other, right? But, but this was um, uh, against some standard antinomianists, right? And, and I, I said to one of the guys, look, okay, what about in the book of Acts? You know, the commandment that says that you're not supposed to eat blood, you're not supposed to eat food sacrificed to idols, these sorts of things, right? I don't usually see Christians caring about that at all. So let's just forget the Torah for a second. Do you think there's any kind of restrictions on you guys, you know, that are, even if it's listed in the New Testament? And, and the, the leader of the other group, they, he really did mental gymnastics to get out of it. No, those are for, for the weaker brothers. We can eat whatever we want. Blood is yummy, you know, <laughs> and I just couldn't believe it, seeing the, the flipping, trying to get through, right, you know, and so I gave him the, the, the verse from Rav Shaul where he says, look, I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. If you eat food sacrificed to idols, you're having communion with demons, basically, right? It, it wasn't touched, wasn't touched, just, he actually ended up just not responding to that thing from me, and so I was thinking about it, I was like, and so I finally said, look, <laughs> If, let's say you've got your, have you guys ever seen the WWJD bracelets? You know, the what would Jesus do? Remember those? They're popular for a while, right? The, the Goish believers would wear them, right? You know, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Eh. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of a good idea, though. I think it's kind of like tzitzit, right? Like tzitzit for them, right? And so, like, you know, the tzitzit, the fringes on the garments, when you look at them, you're supposed to what? Zechor et mitzvot Hashem, right? You're supposed to remember the commandments of God, right? Vasit them and do them right? So this is a good way. What would the Messiah do, basically, right? And so I asked this guy, if you've got, so really, if you're standing in a mall, and you've got your WWJD bracelet on, and there's a Taco Bell, and then there's a Temple of Doom cafe, right? Remember the Temple of Doom? Raiders of the Lost Ark, they drink some blood, right? A couple, uh, you know, maybe have some blood pudding or something. I said, and you're thinking, what would Jesus do? You really think he's going into the Temple of Doom cafe? You really are okay with that? You know, it's just amazing how we lie to ourselves. We lie to ourselves. And, you know, if you're a visitor here today or if you're listening to this later on YouTube or something, then ask yourself, have an open mind. Have I been lying to myself just because it's what everybody around me says is right? It's, it's what I learned in seminary or it's what I learned. What, do you really think that Yeshua would walk into that cafe where they've got a Buddha statue there? But the Chinese food is yummy, but there's a Buddha statue. But I like Vietnamese food. There's a statue of another god there. You think that Yeshua would go in there? Or you think he'd make a whip and start driving everybody out? You know, just the believers, maybe. He'd just drive out those who, what? You gave me lip service, but you don't care? Even what's written in the apostolic writings? You don't even care. And so my point, Rabotai, is that when we're dealing oftentimes with people who are fearful of God's law, right? They don't want to keep his law. They don't want to walk in, in holiness. You have to remember where they're at, right? Oftentimes they're, they're hypnotized by the society that's around them, right? It's a social hypnosis that keeps them from seeing the truth because they won't even obey the commandments that are in the New Testament. They won't even keep those. How often have you been, many of you came from, from Goetia background, Goetia denominations, right? Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever, okay? Go back to those days and think about it. How many of your friends ever said, Oh, I can't go into that that restaurant. It's a Hindu restaurant. They probably offer the food to, to Ganush in the back, right? Did anybody ever express that concern to you? Ever. While they're enjoying the blood pudding or whatever. And that just that is to highlight the, the hypocrisy in that system of faith. It's not really about Torah versus grace, okay? That is a lie that has been whitewashed to people. It's not about that at all. It's just the enemy of God trying to leave lead people away so they cannot have productive lives on the level they could be. He doesn't want 
the followers of Yeshua to be the head and not the tail. He wants them beaten down and impoverished and all that stuff. He does not want, like Rav Shaul, he talks in Ephesians when he talks to the Goyim. And he says, look, you ethnoi, in the Greek, you ethnics, though you were, you were born outside the providences, the promises of the diatakume, the, the covenants, right? It's interesting. He, said, he uses this word, the britot, the covenants. But now you've been brought near through the suffering and the blood of the Messiah, right? So what does that mean? You were outside the covenants, but now you've been brought near. So you're in the covenant now. So let us sin that grace may abound, right? So, okay, I'm sorry I got off a little bit there, but I, I felt it was important. Coming back to this, the Mishpah thought all of the families of the earth shall be engrafted, like the Rashbam says, and like Rav Shaul talks about. You know, so two great rabbis, both having the same idea, one who doesn't realize Yeshua's Mashiach and one who clearly did. Right, pig's hooves. <laughs> Janine comments, I even thought at first they'll be discarded, won't be included in the machut. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it actually is a little bit frightening. Yeah, I think they will be. We've talked about this before. That I, I do believe that the antinomianists, that, the, that our Christian brothers and sisters who do not keep the law of God, that there is a place for them in Olam Baba, as long as they truly have accepted the death of the Messiah, right? And I lean on that truly accepted because therein lays the rub. That is where things should be frightening to you. If you have friends who, who do not keep Shabbat, they don't care about Shabbat, it's, I, they keep the Nine Commandments, I like to say. They believe in the Nine Commandments, right? Not the Ten Commandments. You know, they won't murder, that's good, right? No adultery, that's good. But Sabbath, what? You know, that's, that's only number four. I don't, I don't care about number four. You know. So we should have a little bit of fear for them. Because I don't really know. Nobody can know a person's heart, right? Only God knows. We can't judge them because we don't know, right? They've been taught. They've been hypnotized, etc. They've had these complex systems that are built on protesting Catholics, which is oftentimes called Protestants. But they're really, they came out of the Catholic tradition. And all they did was rebel against the Catholic tradition. They did not go back to the religion from which came this new faith. You think God really planned to throw away his ancient people, whom he promised Abraham that he would make as numerous as the sands of the, as the sea and the stars of the sky, sky, sky the kochavei hashemayim. You really think that was the plan? To start a new religion and toss them aside? Ridiculous. It's ludicrous. You'd have to be a fool to think like that. Or was the plan that's the same religion? There's no new religion. Prophet comes, prophet comes, prophet comes. We keep adapting and tweaking and getting clear understanding. We have rulings on the Torah. We understand as technology improves how to apply the Torah, etc. You keep going. It's the same religion. It's the same mishpacha. And so, v'niv rachu v'cha kol mishpachot hadama uvezarecha. That is true. And I believe it's Ruach HaKodesh that showed the Rashbam this. What an amazing insight. It's about engrafting, about joining Israel. That is how the nations will be blessed. Have you ever thought about it before? If you have the typical old view on this, like all the nations will be blessed by you. Some, some theologians say, oh, because the Messiah comes from us, right? And that's it. Okay, that seems to me to be a little weak, a little lacking, because the text goes on to say, and through your offspring, right? It's like, it, and it's plural, <laughs> you understand? It, it's, it's not just, it can't just be because of Mashiach. Yes, that's a great blessing that people can come to God through him. But there has to be more to be blessed, the kind of blessing that Hashem is giving. Because this word, as I've shared with you before, in the Bikata Kohanim, the, the Aaronic blessing, right? The, you know, the Yevrecha Hashem, Bishmarecha, right? That whole thing. That, as I shared with you from the Rabbi Levine and his, his commentary from the JPS on, on that, that section, that Barach, to bless, implies uh, physical blessings. Right? There's actual blessings like having children, having wealth, these sorts of things. Not just warm, fuzzy feeling inside, not just shalom, not just peace inside, right? The peace that surpasses understanding. That's something different. That's another great thing that Hashem gives to those who follow Him and trust in His Son. That's a different thing. We're talking actual physical blessings. And that comes by being the head and not the tail. And that comes by joining Israel and being good citizens in the kingdom. So that the Holy Spirit, it's more easy for the Holy Spirit to rest upon us if we're not living in sin. And Shaul says that the definition of sin, it's in the Torah, right? I would not have known what sin was if not for the law of God, right? It's just and good and true, etc., etc. So how do you throw it away? 
How do you feel about it? And a lot of times, I've mentioned this before, bear with me, I think it's important to repeat. A lot of times people think that means like, I wouldn't have known about murder, right? They, they, they like to split the law up into the moral law, right? And then the, 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 the cultic features, right? Like how you dress and all that kind of stuff, right? Okay. And they say that's ceremonial law and this is like moral law, as if there's a difference. There's no such, there's no such word in biblical Hebrew as ceremonial law, right? Or ceremonial purity. There's just purity, right? You, you, you look at something you shouldn't look at, you just made your body impure, okay? You eat some baboy, you just made your body impure. You have some shrimp sauce, impure. You accidentally touch a dead rat, you're impure, right, okay? There's no thing, nothing in the holy language that separates that out to be quote-unquote ceremonial. This is wholly the invention of theologians so that they could build up this system of acrobatics to escape from what is right and wrong, right? The way of thinking in the Bible my ways are not your ways, God tells us. And so it, it seems because we want to decide things emotionally, right? We want to have an emotional bent to things. Like, <clears throat> But surely it's about murder and adultery and theft and all these things. Okay, well, as I pointed out before, go to Japan. Japan does not have the law of God. And they understand all those things are wrong. You can park your bicycle with your groceries on it in Japan and go to another store and nobody's going to touch your groceries. They're not going to take it. Do they have God's law? So clearly this is not what Ralph Shaul, the Apostle Paul, is talking about. When he says, without the law of God, I would not have understood what is sin. He's talking about Shabbat. Shabbat. I wouldn't have known that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. I wouldn't have known it. How could you possibly deduce that logically? If you're a Greek philosopher, Plato's Republic's got a lot of good stuff in it. He figured out a lot of stuff. And a lot of it's from his teacher Aristotle, but he figures out a lot of it, right? He, he codifies it real nicely. But he didn't figure out Shabbat. Why? Without the law, I would not have known what sin is. You see? You cannot wrangle it and say, oh, it's talking about the moral law, theft, and, and murder, and adultery, and these sorts of things. Because even the Japanese non-believers have this. And if you're Japanese listening to this, I'm not picking on you. I'm actually complimenting your civilization on how much they have accomplished as far as being a virtuous and a, and a righteous nation without the Bible. It's kind of amazing. But in order to truly stop sinning, they need to know what sin is. And sin is not keeping the Sabbath. Sin is polluting the temple of God with an abomination that you've eaten. Sin is a man laying with a man as he lays with a woman. Right? Sin is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You get it. All right. Coming back. TJ, okay, someone says they see no screen. Sorry, it's really private. <laughs> Does, does everybody see my screen still, or is that lost? Bessie says, so we can't order takeout from those restaurants or groceries that have idols by the cashier? Yes, you cannot. Thanks, thanks, Bessie. That's a great question. I'm glad you clarified. Yes, <coughs> do not do that. Now, I will clarify the Chinese restaurants that have, like, a king or something like that. I think that is kosher, right? I don't think they're offering food to that as a god or something like that. Any of our Chinese believers in here, you can correct me if I'm wrong in this. But I think that's that's a different thing than like a Buddha statue or something. <clears throat> and if you want to be very technical about it, it depends, right? It depends. You could really do some some research and you could talk to them and say, hey, you know, what, what what's with that? What is that? And the worker says, oh, that's the Buddha. You know, and you can say, okay, interesting. Uh, what does that statue mean? What is it doing here? You know, oh, it's just decoration. Okay, maybe that's okay for you, right? Do your due diligence, right? So I'm not trying to deprive you of your favorite restaurant if indeed they're not offering sacrifices to idols, you see? It's safer to put a hedge around things, right? And to not order from that place if you can order from someplace else, okay? But I think you, we have the freedom to do our own research, see, see how the rock leads you, and find out what's really happening there. More dangerous are Indian restaurants, right, where they might have, they really do do offerings to the stack. They might see the very dangerous thing is oftentimes they're idols in the back. You don't even see it. You don't even know it's in the kitchen, right? So, so if you can be more careful, then better to be more careful, right? And some of you will talk about, well, but Paul says, you know, an idol is nothing and blah, 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 you know, and, and, and this, this, this guy I was having a debate with, he said, he said, there are no other gods. And I said, wrong. Okay? 
In English, it's true. There are no other gods. Right? There's just one God, Adonai, right? Hashem. But in Hebrew, Elohim, the word that oftentimes gets translated into English as God, yes, there are. Right? As you recall, the prophet Samuel was even called an Elohim when he was raised from the dead in the Hebrew by the witch at Endor, right? And we have Elohim is used all over the place for, for basically residents of the of the spiritual realm, right? So there are other Elohim. This is why God says, Don't prostrate down to them and don't worship them, right? Because they exist. There are beings that are on a higher plane spiritually and have a lot of power. The principalities that Rav Shaul warns us about, there are, they do exist. In some cases, an idol is truly nothing. And sometimes it's just something some dumb human invented, right? And there's no being associated with it. But in other times, it's a very real expression trying to contact the being, right? What Paul is doing is he's, he's, a, he's using a scalpel a surgeon's scalpel for a very narrow situation. And he's saying, look, they had a situation where their food was coming from markets and it was impossible to tell if before it reached the market if it had been offered to an idol. This was specifically believers who lived in countries where everybody was a pagan, right? Like Ephesus, for example, right? Everyone was a pagan except for the Jews, right? And so you might not always be able to get kosher meat or whatever kosher, right? You don't know if it was, if it was offered to an idol or not, right? And so in that specific case remember shaul paul he's a rabbi he's making a tachina he's making a rabbinical decision you guys to whom i'm writing right now in your present situation where you can't tell at the meat market where it's from and you still got to have food i'm giving you a pass i'm making a mishpat a legally binding judgment that the, that the rabbis can make i'm making a mishpat for you and in your case don't worry about it okay don't worry about it. You have freedom in that case because I don't want you to starve and die. Okay? This is what's happening in that case. And then people, they take it out of context and they try to apply, oh, an idol's nothing, see? Okay, but you just had the commandment in the book of Acts saying don't eat food offered to idols. Right? Shemuel asks, uh, is the Hebrew word for head support plural? May I ask why is it plural? Uh, did he have many heads? Okay, that's a good question. Oftentimes what happens in Tanakhit, we can put a root in a plural form to express a more abstract concept. So you're actually onto something here. So he's asking about up here this uh, this mirashot. Uh, my mouth won't go there. Mirashot. So that ot, that's the feminine plural ending, right? And uh, so he's asking why is it there, right? So it's not really head supports. It's just it's this it's it's expressing this abstract concept of something that is for the head. And interestingly enough, this was actually kind of common in the ancient Near East. To have a hard pillow, people think, oh, how weird. What does it mean that Jacob took a rock? How strange, right? And there might be something to it, but actually we have found in ancient Egypt, they've discovered blocks of wood that were used for pillows, right? And in and, and other cultures, they've discovered uh, stones that were of a certain shape for the person's head. And so this was actually more common than it seems. And it's interesting. It's another example of the Bible capturing what people did, right, in those times. Uh, let's see. Liz... Oh, hold on. Okay, let me see. It looks like some people are having technical issue. Sorry for that. I'll try to post this, Josh. I tried to post the one last week online, but when I exported and uploaded, there was no audio. I thought, weird. So I thought maybe Hashem wanted me to censor out something. So I, I, I deleted some stuff and prayed, and, and I made it shorter, and I exported. Okay. And, I up, and, and before I uploaded, I checked. Audio wasn't there again. So I was thinking, maybe I'm not supposed to upload last week's Josh. So that's why it's not up right now. This one, I don't have any kind of check in the spirit or anything like that, so expect it to be up tonight or tomorrow. Bleed there, there, I'll, I'll upload it. Okay, uh, Jolene and Nathan, they comment, did the meeting stop? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm still here. Hineni, I'm here. Uh, Liz says, okay, she's just clarifying. Okay. okay, 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 okay. I think it's you guys having issues. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, let's continue on then. Good questions, by the way, everybody. Good comments. Yep. Oh, actually, I wanted to go back. One thing, one thing that uh, Shimuel asked about. Another thought I have about your question. It could actually mean plural things. It, even though I'm talking about how plurals they are used to express a concept sometimes. Uh, in this case, it really could be plural because look, look what he says. Me av me hamakom. So this could mean. I think. I think. Who is it? Ah. Uh, is it, I think it's Rashi. 
I think Rashi actually expresses the point that you're you're leading on about. It says from the stones of the place. So that could mean he took one from the stones, or it could mean that he took Vaikak, he took this is Lakak, by the way, the, the Lamed is inside the Kuf there, that's why you can't see it. He took from the stones of the place. So it could mean he took several stones. It could actually mean like maybe pebbles or something, maybe that's softer. So you could actually interpret it the way that you're asking about it, Shimon. It just occurred to me. So either the way I explained it or that, either one, either one. I, I can't really definitively say which one. So it could be exactly as you're saying. Nice point. Verse Tetvav, right? So of course, um, I just want to repeat this for those of you who are new. When we count in Hebrew, not when we count, but when we do Hebrew numerals, we use the letters as numerals. Everything is logical, right? So 10 is Yod, okay? Come on, God. Uh, it looks like a llama. It's terrible. <laughs> I just do a, a cursive one. That's Yod, okay? And if you want to say 11, you do Yod plus Aleph, right? Aleph is 1, so that's 11. 12 is Yod. 10 plus Bet, right? 1 plus 2. 13, Yod plus Gimel, right? 13. 14, Yod plus Dalet. Oops, sorry, cursive Dalit. Yod plus Dalit. Okay? 10 plus 4. So you would think that 15 would be Yod plus He, but it's not. This is 15 over here. This is 15. It's actually Tet, which is 9 plus Vav, 6. 9 plus 6. So you still get 15. Why? Why is it illogical here? Okay? It's illogical. Because Yod He is the nickname for the Tetragrammaton for Yod He Wow He, right? And we do not want to make even God's nickname, even the part that we can say. We can say this, like we say Hallelujah, right? We say it. We can say it. But we should even treat the nickname with respect. You shouldn't run around saying, you know, in Jewish circles, Jewish tradition, we say Ka. If we're not praying or something or expressing gratitude like Hallelujah, Right? We'll say Ka instead of Ya. Even though it's not God's name, it's the pronounceable nickname part. You cannot say the Yod He, Wau He part, but you can say this one. But our ancestors, when they wrote down the Hebrew text in numbering, they did not want to show any kind of disrespect to God's name and use his name as a number. And so instead of writing Yod He, they write Tet Vav. Right? So for any of you who think it's okay, but I'm a teacher, I could say God's name. No. You're not supposed to say God's name because you're a teacher. You're still defaming his name, okay? You're making it normal to be pronounced by your lips, and you're making people who are listening to the audience who might be in sin hear the divine name, and that can be actually dangerous for their health and their spirit, too. Okay, so, Right, the Tetragrammaton, exactly. So, behold, I am Imach with you. Ushamar, you guys know Shamar. Shamarti means I protected, I kept it, I kept. The U is the Vav conversive, so it makes the time the opposite. So instead of I kept, and I will keep, who? Cha. Cha is you in Hebrew. Ushamarti cha, I will keep you, the Chol Asher Telech, in all Asher, which? Telech. This is from Halach, although my friend Ibn Ezra would say it's Yalach. They mean the same thing. Go where you will go. The Hashivoticha. And this is a hefil from, from Shuv. It's not Shabbat. It's Shuv. There's a, there's a Wow here in the middle letter. So Sheen, Wow, or Vav, and Beit. Shuv. Like Shuvah me, return my people, right? Or Teshuvah, make repentance. The He is the hefil Binyan indicator, right? So this tells us cause to, in whatever the meaning is. So, I will cause to return, ha, you. So I will bring you back, right? I will bring you back, I will return you, el ha'adamahazot, unto this land. Ki lo ezavecha ha'ad asher im asiti et asher dibarti because I will not azav, 
like Yeshua on the execution stake. He says, Eli, Eli, lama azavtani. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Right? When he's quoting from the psalm and not showing any desperation, but he's quoting the entire psalm as a prophecy. And so azav is to abandon and forsake. Ezav means I will abandon. Cha, but he says, lo, I will not abandon cha. I won't abandon you. Ad, until asher, that which im asiti. This one's a little bit harder to recognize the verb here. It's ayin sin hey. There's a hey at the end. But it's a lamed hey verb. And these kinds of verbs that end in hey, the hey oftentimes disappears or changes to a tav. Right? So asa is the verb. So until I, that which I have done, et asher, that which dibalti, I promised lach to you. It's literally I spoke to you, but contextually this can be promised. And then tet zayin again. Well, again with the tet, what's with the tet, right? It should logically be yod, wow, yod vav, right? But again, this is part of the divine name. So the ancients, when they wrote down the Hebrew text, they decided instead to do 9 plus 7, which is still 16. 9 for the tet plus zayin is 7 equals 16. Look, we get back to normal with 17, yod zayin, and 18, yod chet and 19, yod tet, everything's normal, right? But only for 15 and 16, as a reminder that you should safeguard and protect the divine name in speech, and do not say it. Vayikatz Yaakov nishnato vayomer, achen, yesh avodai bamakom hazeh. This vav I wouldn't say is and, I'd probably say then. Then, Yaakov woke up, nishnato, from his, that's the vav here, it's his, shena. Shena, this was a hey, but it goes to the construct state when you put a suffix on the end. It goes back to the ancient Hebrew ending. Feminine nouns in ancient Hebrew before the Bible ended in tav. So it goes back to that form. From his shena, from his sleep, vayomer, and he said, achen, alas, or check it out, yesh, those of you who speak Russian, this is just like yest. Yest min yeshtota, ktori ya mogu uspozovat. I have something that I can use, right? Yest. That it's interesting that it came from Hebrew, yesh into Hebrew into Russian is yes. They use it the same way. So exist. Literally it's like to exist. There is. Ex exist there is Adonai. Oh, pardon me, Elohim, Elohim. I read it wrong, Elohim. You see the pointing here? This tells us that this is Elohim, not Adonai. So there is Elohim, God, Bamakomaze, in this place. The Anochi Lo Yadati. And I myself did not even know it. I didn't know. You don't need this anochi. This is superfluous, right? The text is trying to tell you something about this. This is probably the vav ex, 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 emphaticum, <laughs> which means it's like a little exclamation point, right? So you don't say and. You don't have to say and. You could just say, like make it bold. I didn't even yadati. Lo yadati means I didn't know. See, this e is already I. We don't need the anochi. So I myself did not even know it. Yod Zion, 17. Vayira vayoma vayoma. Then he was afraid. The verb is yara. He was afraid. The correct response when we know that Hashem is present somewhere. Vayomar, and he said, Ma how awesome, how terrible, how awesome, hamakom hazeh. And then we had to make it make sense in English, we have to say, is this place. Ein zeki im beit Elohim vezeh sha'ar hashamayim. Is not this, it kind of gets wordy here in Hebrew, it, you have to just say, is it not so that this is the Beit Elohim, the house of God? Or a house of gods, which probably he's not saying. And this, or probably emphaticum, this certainly is the Sha'ar, the gate of the heavens, the gateway of the heavens. Svorno comments in the Mikhail Gadot, the stairway shows that the place where it was standing is the place from which HaKadosh Baruch Hu hears prayer. There are certain places on the earth <coughs> where it's easier for us to get our prayers heard. When we have our bodies in the correct state, our bodies have the Kedushat Hashem, the holiness, Kedusha, you've been keeping kosher, not eating unclean foods, you haven't touched any unclean things, you're not in your menses, and then you haven't had nocturnal omission, you know, you've you haven't looked at, at Lashon Hara, wicked speech on Facebook, right? You haven't, you know, we've kept ourselves pure and holy. If you're wearing the mitzvot, you're keep, men, you're wearing tzitzit, women, if you feel led to also. You know, men, you're doing your tefillin, you're, you're keeping the mitzvot, right? 
Then you go to a holy location. Wa 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 wa. God's going to hear your prayer. He's going to hear your prayer. You've got the trifecta going on. Holy place. And if it's on a moed, holy place, holy time, holy person, yes. And make sure, Rabotai, when God answers your prayer, it's a good practice to say the asher shame'a tefillah, right? So the prayer, the blessing starts out the same as most of the blessings. Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu melech haolam. And then you say, asher hu shome'a hears tefillah, prayer. Asher shome'a tefillah, who hears prayer, right? When he answers your prayer, you say that blessing. Make sure to give the blessing to him. The Talmud Tractate Berachot says that we should endeavor to bless HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He, a hundred times a day. That we try to bless Him a hundred times a day. So don't miss out on saying a bracha to Him when you get a chance. That's what it means to bless the Holy Name. It doesn't mean to spout out, Yod, hey, wow, hey, right? To go around trying to say it or something, right? It means you bless Him. You thank Him. You wake up with the Modayani, the Fanecha, Melechai, the Kayam, right? You wake up with that blessing, with a blessing on your lips. Verse Yod Chet. 18. Vayashken Yaakov Baboke Vayikach et Haeven Ashesam Ashatov. Sorry, I went Ashkenazi there for a second time. Vayasem Ota Matseva. Okay. <clears throat> and Yaakov got up early, Baboke, in the morning. There's our footprint from the. There was a ha there before. Vayikach, this is Lakach, the Lamed is hiding in there, that's why the dot's there. And he took the stone, which, okay, so here we now, it's one stone. So this actually answers your question better. <laughs> this is our correction. ha Evan, the stone, right? Not Ha-Avanim, or Ha-Avnaim, not two stones, not stones. He took the stone, Asher Sam, which he placed, Me'er at his head space. Vayasem, and he set Ota, her, because stones are hers, even though it doesn't look like it, it is. Matseva. This is interesting. You might not notice this, but remember I talked about Natsav to take your stand, hinting about Ruach of Kodesh and all this sorts of stuff? Well, this is a Matseva, which is a memorial stone, but the root is Natsav. Oh, come on, draw, won't you? Natsav. The Dagesh here tells me there's a pay noon. Noon, sorry, bait. To take its stand, right? So the memorial stone took its stand. He set it up as a memorial stone to remind him of the place, probably so he could find it easily again. Vayitzok shemen al rosha. And he poured out shemen, probably olive oil. Shemen means oil. Al upon rosha, or her head. Who's the her? Ha'evan, the stone. Verse Yod Tet, 19. Vayikaha et shem hamakom ha'hu beis el. So he called the name of the place, okay, construct chain, sorry it's not in blue, which one? Hahu, the that one, Beth Ale. And I say the because whenever we talk about people's names or place names, I think it's best to use the ancient pronunciation. And this is a Tav. Tav, without a dogish, there's no dot, was a TH sound. So even though we won't usually read it that way, we'll usually use more like the, um, the Israeli pronunciation, which is Sephardic. The Ashkenazi, we have a tradition of pronouncing this differently. So when there's no dot there, we'd say s, it'd be basil, right? And if it had a dot, it'd be bait ale then, right? But the, the correct pronunciation, uh, I believe the Yemenites do it this way, correct me if I'm wrong, Isa is th, to make the th, the th sound, which is closer to the ancient pronunciation. It's a name, it's bethel, right? Which is why it comes into English as bethel. The ulam, luz, but it's known as luz, shem ha'ir, the name of the city, la rishona, <coughs> when it started. Finishing up our first Aliyah, verse Kaf. Vayido Yaakov, neder lemor. So this word you might not recognize. See the Dalit? What do you think that Dalit is? It's a noon. It's a noon. So the verb is nadar, right? Yidor, it used to be in ancient Hebrew, yindor. But people like to say things easier. It became yidor. And then finally, yida. So that means he will make a vow. But we have our Vav here that it acts as a time, a flux capacitor, and it swaps the time. So instead of, and he will vow, it says, and he vowed. Or so he made a vow. So Yaakov vowed a neder, he vowed a vow. Lemo saying, 
עם אדוני אלוהים עמדי ושמרני בדרך הזה אשר אנוכי הולך ונתן לי לחם לאכול ובגד ללבוש. If Adonai, God, it's interesting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I even said it wrong when I was singing. I saw a wav here. Yihyeh. Im yihyeh Elohim. If God will be, see, because if there was a vav, it's already Adonai. <laughs> if, if God will be, imadi with me, ushamarani, and he will protect me, that's me, Vaderech on the way, Haze on this path, Asher which Anochi Holech, which I am going on, Venatanli, and he gives me lechem, bread, lechol to eat, or food to eat, uveged, and clothing, Lilvosh to dress, verse Kaf Aleph 21, Veshavti Veshalom El Beit Avi, and I shuv, this is the shuv, the vav in the middle, it disappeared, that happens with hollow verbs, so Shin, and then Vav, and then Vait, like Shuv, which return. And I return the Shalom safely, literally means in peace, El Beit Avi, to the house of my father. To the Then what's going to happen? This Vav is probably then, don't say and. Then, Haya Adonai Li Lelohim. Then God will become, or pardon me, Adonai will become, he will be to me God. Or for gods, literally, is what it's saying there. This is very interesting. Look at the requirements that Yaakov Avinu laid out. In order to, he's basically saying, okay, check it out. He's making a vow. Remember, the difference, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, Esau makes the point that the Ashkenazim can't pronounce the th, so instead we use the S, Shabbos, for Shabbos, right? Like good Shabbos in Yiddish, yeah, exactly. Beis and Beis, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Like German speakers, they don't say th in German. And Yiddish is Germanic. And the Ashkenazi, Yiddish was a, is the language. So, yeah, that's a good theory. I think that makes sense. So, so what happens here, what is, what is, he makes a nether. Remember, if you make an oath, you just have to do it. If you make a nether, it's contingent. You only have to do the nether if Hashem does his part, right? So you say, look, God, I don't know if you want me to do this or not, but here's my nether. By the way, it's not a good practice to make netheres, okay? And even we say bli nether without a, without a vow, right? Sometimes if you're telling someone, oh yeah, I'll come by tomorrow and help you with your whatever, I'll help build your house or something. It's a good idea to say bli nether. So it's clear to Hashemai you're not making a vow, okay? He's not promising, <laughs> okay? You're not making an oath or a vow or anything like that without a vow. So, so his vow was very simple, the requirements he put on God because he really understands the teachings from his parent, right? Who God is. What does he require from them? He says, if you protect me, like you don't let me die, and you give me food and clothing and return me safely to my father's house, then you'll be my God. Now think about your own life. <laughs> How do we, what kind of requirements do we put on God? Like, is there somebody in your life who's supposed to be a believer who tells you, why do bad things always happen to me? You ever heard that? You ever hear somebody say that nonsense? Why do bad things always happen to me? Okay, first of all, probably they don't. You know, a lot of times we pull things out of perspective, right? You know, maybe the bad thing is someone didn't like you or they made fun of you at work or, you know, whatever, right? But did you survive on the, 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 the derech? <laughs> did you starve? Do you have lechem to eat? Are you naked on the street or wearing sackcloth? Did you make it where you were going without being cut by holduppers? If all those things are true, then maybe bad things have not happened to you. Maybe what we perceive as a bad thing is because we are so blessed beyond belief that when something that seems to us is bad, our troubles are not necessarily troubles. And I realize some of you listening might be in really hard situations, so I'm not minimizing your situation, right? This message might not be for you, right? But maybe it will be in the future when God has improved your situation. That you can look back and realize how bad you had it before and how Shem has brought you out of that. And you should not blame God. It really ticks me off when I hear believers blaming God or they get mad about God because they didn't get rich or they didn't get what they wanted or you know, they try to use the Torah as some kind of system in which they deserve to be blessed or something like that. 
You know, I mentioned before, I have some respect, actually, for the Tzedokim, the, the Sadducees. Because the Sadducees did not even believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And they still kept Torah. Just because. Just because he, he gave us breath to Meshem Mateno. He gave the breath to our souls, right? Just because he gave That was enough for them. This is why I cannot stand fire and brimstone preaching. You know, the preacher comes out and he tries to scare the crap out of everybody. You know, like, you know, you're going to go to hell unless blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, come on. Do you really think that's what God wants? Does he want you to come to him willingly out of love because of what he did for you or because you're scared about what's going to happen to you? The better way is Ahava. That's why we keep Torah. It's an expression of Ahava. The Torah, the Torah Tashem, is his love language. Right? Like I've mentioned before, you know, different people, they have a different quote-unquote love language, right? Like a way to express appreciation to them, right? Some of us, it's when someone gives you something, you might feel, you might feel love then, right? That makes you feel love, maybe because you grew up without a lot of stuff, right? And so when someone gives you something, it, that shows you, wow, you realize the sacrifice or whatever, right? For other people, it's just a compliment, right? Or just kind speech or something. Or, or being there, spending time with you, right? Showing that you matter in their life, right? Different people, they have a different love language right like the way that, and then sometimes they foolishly express love back in their own love language not realizing the other person doesn't know what the heck they're doing right and so there's like a disconnect right hashem's love language is the torah and the way that we ex keeping the torah it's not so that we are counted as righteous right all our righteousness is as filthy rags by the navi yeshiahu right but our expression of not taking his son's death for granted our expression of not being cavalier and mistreating what happened on our accounts, our expression of Havat Hashem is keeping the Torah. That's how we show Him we love Him. What does the Messiah say? In Agapa say man, in the Greek, you know, if you love me, Terosontain and Tulein Mui, you will keep my commandments. You'll keep your Kishmeru et Mitzvotai. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's the expression. It's always been the expression. Just like I shared with you guys a few weeks back. Remember the verse where, in Mark where the rich man, he comes up and he says, Rabbi, what do I have to do for eternal life? And Yeshua says, keep the mitzvot, keep the commandments. And he says, I've done this in my youth up. And then it says Yeshua felt love for him. Right? Why did Yeshua feel love for him? Why does the text tell us that he felt love? At that moment... What were we just told? What was the new information about this man, other than that he's rich? The new information was he kept the Torah since his youth up. I'm a Torah keeper. At that moment, Yeshua felt love for him. Why? Because it's God's love language. The Torah is God's love language. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Esau asked, are there still tzedakim today? No, that sect died out. Or Jews who believe like Tzedekin did. Not that I'm aware of. Maybe the Samaritans a little bit. I think the Samaritans reject the Nach, right? I think they only have the Torah. So they might be kind of similar, quasi-similar. Although they're weird in that they believe it's a different mountain than Jerusalem and all this stuff. Yeah, like the Perashim? Yeah. I, well, there were two houses of the Perashim, right? One died out. The one that Yeshua is always arguing with, this is Beit Shammai. Right? Beit Shammai, very hard-headed, very unforgiving, you know, and Beit Shammai basically controlled the Sanhedrin in Yeshua's lifetime, right, when he was on earth. And Beit Shammai, the Talmud makes fun of them all the time, right, just like the apostolic writing does. What, it's just unfortunate that it comes down into the Greek, right, as just one group of people. The Greek doesn't bother to distinguish between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, the house of Hillel. Hillel is the one who wrote the Lord's Prayer. Right? So Yeshua, he actually gives props to those Pharisees, to the, 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 the Hillelites. Right? He says, yeah, you're correct. When his disciples say, how do we pray? They could be asking, do we pray like the Shemites? Do we pray like the Essenes? <coughs> do we pray like normal Amaharats? Or do we pray like, you know, like Beit Hillel? Yeshua says, you pray like Beit Hillel. Or Avinu Sheba Shemayim, right? Our Father is in heaven. Right? And so he takes a subset from a famous Hillelite prayer. Right? And so... So it's very interesting. So when you say about the Pharisees, yes, the house of Hillel has survived. That's where Orthodox Judaism comes from today. But the house of Shammai, who's always challenging Yeshua, 
they were defeated, and in a single day, all but two of their rulings in the Sanhedrin were reversed, right, once the Hillelites got the majority. So that's kind of a little, I'm glad you asked that. That's a nuance people oftentimes misunderstand. What, are you trying to be pharisaical? Or well, yeah, it's not bad to be pharisaical if you're being like the Hillelites, right? Those who wrote the Lord's Prayer and with whom Yeshua oftentimes agreed, and that there's forgiveness, there's a way back. That The Hillelites believe that a person who comes from a sinful life, who then makes Teshuvah and returns to God, can stand on a higher plane, even than someone who was born and raised by religious parents their entire life, right? So yeah, there's hope for you. If you're Shemite, they didn't want to have anything to do with you if your parents were like prostitutes or whatever, right? You know, it's like, ugh, you're untouchable, like in India, right? You're like a lower caste. Get out of here, right? No, but I love God, but no. The Shemites, there are some interesting teachings from the Shemites still, even still, right? Because they're still grappling with the text, but just very, very, very hard. Whereas Hillel, there's Chesed, right? There's the clan loyalty, the, the quote-unquote grace and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, much kinder, exactly. There's, there's a famous story about there's a foreigner, a Ger, he comes to Shammai, and he says, I want you to teach me the Torah. And Shammai says, okay. And he says, but teach it to me standing on one foot. And Shammai drives him, get out of here. He drives him out of there, you know. And he goes to Hillel, and he tells Hillel. And Hillel says, okay. He says, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. You know, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the crux of the Torah, right? The love of the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength, etc. Now go study, <laughs> right? So, so Hillel's arms are open. He's inviting the students in. He's inviting the converts in. He's inviting people to be grafted in. Shammai is pushing people away. And even within secular, and secular, even within Judaism that does not have Mashiach Yeshua, uh, the, the, the sect that survived were the Hillelites predominantly. He says the Samaritans are Arabic speakers today, loyal to the Palestinians. Goodness, I didn't realize they're loyal to the, Phil the Philistines, the modern Philistine spirit, and critical of Israel, living mainly in Nablus. Although there's only 400 of them, so who cares? Okay, 800. He's all right. So I was close. Only 800 remaining. They use a, a Paleo-Hebraic writing system in their Torah, and they claim to have the oldest Torah ever that's about 4,000 years old. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeshua kind of gave him a smack in the face, though, didn't he? Right? When, when Yeshua meets with a Samaritan woman, he's like, you Samaritans don't know what you're talking about. Salvation is from the Jews. Salvation is from Judah, right? So, so even the Messiah, he's kind of got a bit of an attitude when he's dealing with the, with the Samaritans. Like, you guys have been off. What are you talking about? Mount. You know, he, your mountain being holier than, Jer than Jerusalem, than Mount Moriah, you're kidding me, right? So, but that's a nice, thanks for sharing that, Esau, very interesting. I thought there were only 400 left. Maybe it's grown since I learned that stat. Ah, oh, yeah, Janine's talking about the Shemites. Yes, correct. Esau says, their Ten Commandments are a bit different. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, uh, the critical text, the, Bibli the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, and also the BHQ, they occasionally reference the Samaritan Pentateuch, right? So there's occasion, there's a reference, the Samaritans have this word instead, right? And so, you know, it's interesting for scholarly study and debate to see sometimes what they have, but I, I don't think really they become as numerous as the sands of the sea, that's for sure, 800 left. <laughs> and I don't think it's, I don't think they're the remnant, 7,000 who didn't bow the knee to Baal, because there's not even a thousand of them, right? So I think it's pretty safe to say that they don't have things right. Could be. Esau's commenting that he thinks one of the commandments they have is to sanctify the Mount of Jacob. So that would make sense why they have this other mountain. And it's hard for them to find women for the men too, right? Yeah, so he can continue. They still do sacrifices. They still slaughter goats and stuff, you know? So it's kind of interesting as a curiosity. I did not know they were against Israel. That's too bad. They are fools. <laughs> They'll continue to dwindle. They even allow some Muslim and Christian and Jewish women to become Samaritan to marry the men. Interesting. Verse Kaf Beit Vehaeven Hazlohot Asher Shati Mateva Ihei Beit Elohim And this stone which I have placed as a Matseva Remember there's Matsav as part of that root as a memorial stone will be Beit Elohim will be the house of God Interesting Vechol Asher Titenli Aser Ve Sorry, there's no ve. Asorenu lach. And everything which, this is natan, you might not recognize it's the verb natan. The noon again, there's the dot inside, right? So in ancient times it would have been teen ten. And then just so it's just easier to say is titen, right? Everything which you will give to me, 
aser aserinu. This is an infinitive absolute here. So it means definitely, I will definitely tithe it lach to you. Sorry, guys, I'm not sure if I'm going to meet my hour and 45-minute goal. <laughs> uh, uh, if we hit two hours, I hope you guys don't mind. I've been trying to shorten these down since you have teachings in the morning also. But hey, it's Torah, right? So I think I'd, I'll definitely be able to get you out by 7, I think. All right, so Yashka went out. So Yaakov went out to Be'er Shava and went to Haran. And he happened upon the place. Okay, so has it really happened? It is it reached? According to the Palestinian Targums, what? The Palestinians have Targums? <gasps> what, what, what? <laughs> this is just a scholarly term. I'm quoting from a book here, so that's why. I hate to use the term Palestinian, but that's just, we have the Palestinian Talmud, sometimes the Jerusalem Talmud's called, just because that area was called Palestine, because it was renamed by the Romans in a way that is offensive to Jews, right? So they wanted to offend us, so they renamed it Philistia, right? After the Philistines, the ancient enemies of the Jews. Yofi, good, good, good. Janine says, no rush. All right. So in Yonatan, in the Ushalmi Targum, it's, they insist that a miracle happened here to make Yaakov Avinu stop for the night at Bethel. So there's some tradition that there was a miracle there. And that the symbolism of the word, i.e. Mashiach, being the actual ladder to heaven, is quite remarkable. This is from the book, The Jewish Targums and John's Logos Theology. An excellent book, quite scholarly. He's a, uh, I believe he was a mechanical engineer who became a scholar, a biblical scholar, later in life. And then he discovered that there had not been a huge comparison about the Memra throughout all the Targumim, the Memra in, in the Yakara and these things, and the Devura, Devir, pardon me, the Devura to uh, the Malach Hashem, and so he wrote a whole book on it. It's quite nice. And that's what that's from. The place, and spent the night there because the sun was going down. So he took from the stones of the place. <clears throat> Habakom here reminds us of Hashem being the ever-present one. And he set one at his head and slept in that place. Then he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder. And I did put ladder in my own translation here. I might change that. <laughs> I put it just because it's so embedded and traditional. But I do have a footnote. And the footnote says, Sulam has various meanings. I already shared you about that, like the ziggurat in the ancient Near Eastern stuff. And uh, this is a quote from the Jewish Encyclopedia. Standing on the ground, and its top was touching the heavens. And now there were angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold... Adonai was standing over him, and he said, okay, what's this Adonai? Nitzav, alav. This is an instance of the Memra. You guys all remember the Aramaic Memra, meaning the word. Also, Debura, we get it this way. The word manifest in order to visit man directly. This is from a nice classic written by a Messianic Jew known as Alfred Edersheim in the 1800s. It's in the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. And I want to show you from the Basorat Yochanan, chapter 1, verse 51. So this is the good news of John. Chapter 1, verse 51, it says, Kailegi alto, amen, amen, lego humen, obsesteton uranon, aneogota, kaitus angelus tuseu, anabaintos, kai katabaintos, epiton, huion tu anthropu. This is Yeshua speaking. And he said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you that you will see the heavens opened up, and the angels of the God ascending and descending onto the Son of Man, the Bar Enosh, right? The messianic term that he uses to refer to himself that we get from the book of Daniel in the Aramaic, Bar Enosh. And it's very quite striking here that this indeed is the Memra. And that's why Yaakov was able to even see Adonai, right? Because it's actually the Malach Hashem. As we saw, remember we looked in the Targum, and the Targum translated it as the glory of God, right? The glory of, pardon me, the glory, the Yod, Wow, Yod. In the Aramaic it said the glory of Hashem was, Adat was standing there. So it's quite interesting. The glory of Hashem, that is the Memra, that is the Mashiach, before he's ever been born, this is, this is the Ben, and so Yeshua himself here in John, he's connecting himself to this that Yaakov Avinu saw. He's connecting. He's saying it's true. Just like our father saw angels descending and ascending, also you will see angels ascending and descending onto the Baranosh. 
the Mashiach, the Memra, Hologos. I am Adonai, Avraham, your father's God. As I pointed out, he already refers to him as father, even though it's his grandfather. Breshi 28, 16 through 20, the first part. Then Yaakov woke from his sleep and said, Surely Adonai is in this place, and I did not know it. So he feared and said, so he feared, look at his first, he makes the connection, Adonai was here, and what does he say? Oh, the glory cloud was here. Look at all this gold glitter that's on everything. The glory cloud. Woohoo! Right? Even though we're eating pork and doing all kinds of stuff, the glory cloud. No. He feared. This is the proper response when you know for sure that the Shekhinat Hashem has been in a place, or the Memra, right? Such an intense flux of God's self in that place. Sorry for the physics terms. There's a shout out to to Dr. Duane from Matsati.com, who's from our organization, a messianic uh, minister, and he's actually a, a PhD in chemistry. So if you're listening to this, that's the that's the, the science shout out to you, Duane. <laughs> How awesome is this place? Surely this is the house of God, the Beit Elohim. Now it's interesting there's a special symbol in the Masorah, a hay. This dot should have been on top of the hay. The Hebrew numeral 5 with a dot on top, indicating this phrase only occurs five times in the Bible. So again, when I talk about the Masorah, you see all these little dots, these vowels. This tells us how to read the text, and oftentimes it tells us the meaning. Because if you change the vowels in Hebrew, the meaning can be quite different. So for example, I could take the root, dalit, bet, resh, and I could say, well, it's davar, word, right? Or I could say it's devir, holy of holies. Or I could say it's Dever, pestilence, right? Or I could say it's Devora, it's a bee, right? right you know, et cetera. Or I could say it's Deber, speak, right? Or you can, you can or I could say it's Dabur, uh, to to uh, exert dominion, right? So there's there's all these different things just by changing these, these little nikudot. These are our tradition. That's in the Masora, that's used in the Westminster Leningrad Codex, in the BHS, Bibi Hebraica Sutkartensia, and what has survived from the Aleppo Codex, in all translations of Bibles, right? So it's interesting that the Goyim, when they make the Christian translations of the Bible, they like these, they like the vowels, right? They're okay with that. But these other things, like what I'm talking about, they don't care about. It's in the same scripture, you understand? It's the same tradition. The very same people who told us, this is how you say these words, are the ones who say, put a dot over the hay here. But it's just discarded. Just like I showed you last time in how Yaakov Avinu, when he goes before his father, his father says, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Get out. Who are you? When he says, who are you? Yaakov responds. He says, Anochi, he, it is I. And the accent marks, Lul Ta'amin, tell us to stop. And then he says, what? Esau Bechorecha. Esau is your firstborn. Right? So he's trying not to lie. Right? But those traditions and the Nikorot of the vowels are just thrown out by many Bible translators. Right? They like the vowels, but they don't like the other things that our ancestors put in the text. And this is one of them. And it's sad to me that these are stripped from the Bible. There's even some Hebrew Bibles sold by Christian places that they remove it. They think it's unimportant, right? Who are you to decide that the vowels are great and the other stuff is not great? It's all part of the Masora. So here it is written, Beit Elohim, House of Gods, perhaps indicating Yaakov Avinu's knowledge of the Divine Council. This is just my comment. Or just referencing the fact that heavenly beings and Hashem were present there. Beit Elohim occurs here and in these places where I listed. For those who are curious, where else you'd like to look it up and see if there's a connection. And this is a nice, by the way, those of you who want to dig a little bit deeper, this is a nice rabbinical hermeneutic called Gezer Shava. When you find a phrase that's only a few places in the Bible, and you look at the other verses, there's a belief that there's a connection. There's a spiritual connection to those other verses. And sometimes you can find some really neat gems that way. So I did not go and compare all of those, but maybe one of you can and share with us uh, and see if there's something connecting them nicely there. And this is the gateway of the heavens. Yaakov got up early in the morning and took the stone which was at his head, and he set it as a memorial stone, as a matseva and poured oil over its top. By the way, I'm reading, this is from my from my book, the uh, Genesis Look Again, from the Torah series that we're releasing. 
And so that's that. In case you're wondering why the w w looks like it's cut from somewhere, I'm not taking someone else's work. This, this is mine. Baruch Hashem. He then called the name of that place Beit El, but the name of the city was first called Luz. Then, okay, hold on, let's stop here. Memorial stone here. This is something I want to point out. You know, we kind of have this debate that I touched on last time, where one of the sages, um, or maybe it was two times ago, Nachmanides, was pointing out that it's incorrect, the idea that Avraham Avinu had all the Torah, right? Even though we do have tradition that says, uh, even though the Mishnah in chapter 4 uh, talks about how, Yaakov, how Avraham Avinu had the entire Torah, he knows the whole Torah, but Nachmanides and some other sages, they argue against this, right? And so Nachmanides was saying, look, obviously not, because he didn't know about this law, he didn't do this particular thing, right? And so I believe, I kind of lean towards Nachmanides' position, and here I think is an evidence of it. Because later, Moshe Rabbeinu, he gives us a mitzvah, you shall not make a matzivah, not make a memorial stone, okay? God doesn't need your help, he doesn't need a memorial stone, okay? Don't do it. So I think this, Yaakov Avinu was doing nothing wrong because that Torah commandment had not yet been revealed, and so I believe that this is evidence. Again, I could be wrong. It could be wrong. It could be wrong. Uh, don't be mad at me if you hold a different position. This is a tertiary issue. It's not that important. It's just interesting to me. So I'm mentioning it. So I think this is evidence that the full Torah had not yet been revealed. Because why would Yaakov do what is later considered evil? Only evil because, as Rav Shol says, without the Torah, I would not have known that it's sin, right? And he poured oil over its top. You can see there's references... 26.7, Mark 14.3. Here, I'll pull up one of them here. When well, this, is, this is my translation, so I'll just go into the English. When Yeshua was in Beit Ania, in Shimon the leper's house, a woman having a sealed alabaster flask with expensive aromatic ointment poured it over his head as he was reclining at the Bible. At the Bible. <laughs> at the table. My mind was trying to multitask there, and I'm not so great always at multitasking. What I was wanting to point out is that, is that if you... Uh, uh, if you take this, um, okay, katechein, if you take this and you back it out into the Hebrew, we get the same verb here to pour out, right? And so I'm doing a gazer shava, that rabbinical tool here, into the apostolic writings, going when we find out what the Hebrew word would have been that maps to the Greek through the Septuagint, right? So this is interesting. We previously saw that in the Targumim that they say it, it, they're hinting that it's the Memra. Right, that it's the glory of God that's in that place that he saw, right? And so now, oftentimes, Yeshua refers to, he refers to, well, I'm sorry, in the Apostolic Writings, we get a reference to the cornerstone, the Rosh Pina, right, that was rejected, that, that the builders rejected, the stone, the stone that was rejected now has become the Rosh Pina, the cornerstone, right, the chief stone in the building, right? And so there's this idea that the stone, there was a stone that followed people around, we're taught in tradition, giving them water, and that, that stone was Mashiach, right? So oftentimes, in rabbinical thought, stone or ha'evan it, it's actually uh, and sometimes we refer to god himself as hatsul right the great stone the really big cliff right but that mashiach is ha'evan he's a, he's a smaller stone that this is a is symbolic of the mashiach and so i think there's a nice connection here by using that method that i just told you about using the same phrase where it occurs in the apostolic writings we see that indeed just as he poured our ancestor yaakov poured oil over the top of 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 the stone so too, the stone that he made into a matzeva, so too, this lady recognizes Mashiach, Yeshua as Mashiach, and she pours expensive aromatic ointment over his head while he's reclining at the table. Then Yaakov vowed a vow saying, if Adonai Elohim, let's see, we, we've covered that part already. Then he said, look, the day is still great. Okay, this is later. So I can't go through the whole Torah portion. We'd be here for five hours, right? So this is later when Yaakov is at the well where he's going to meet Rachala, right? And so it says in verse Zion, verse 7, he, he's talking to the shepherds. He says, look, the day is still great. It is not yet the time of the gathering of the herds. Why not water the flocks and go drive them out to pasture? Okay, so this is kind of interesting. These guys he never met before, he's giving them advice. And on the surface, this is against Derek Eretz, what we'd call like proper social conduct, right? People who don't even know, you don't walk up and say, hey, dummy, get to work, right? So I want to talk about this a little bit and see what we can learn from Yaakov Avinu here. Sarna, in, in one of the JPS volumes, says the imperative is used here. 
Hashku. Cause him to drink. But the context demands that Yaakov is not commanding strangers, right? So we would expect this actually to be the imperfect. It's like a softer way of doing something. But instead, it's an imperative. More likely, this was just the speech pattern of the day. That's Sarna's opinion on this. Chizkuni asserts that Yaakov, this is from the Mikhov Gedolot, that Yaakov Avinu wanted the others gone when he met Rachel. That's why he's saying, hey, why don't you go water so you can get out of here, right? <laughs> While Svorno thinks that Yaakov was irritated that the shepherds were shirking their duties. You get this? Shirking their duties. They're not being good laborers for their masters. And writes, a man of iniquity is a to'eva, to'eva, la tzaddik, an abomination to a tzaddik, to a, a lawful man, a just man, righteous man. It's interesting. So he's telling the pastors, why are you laying around? Why are you in the hammock right now? You're not doing the work you're supposed to do. Now here's their defense. They said, we aren't able until all the herds are gathered. Then they roll the stone from upon the mouth of the well and give water to the flock. So we aren't able. Look at that. We aren't able. Then they roll et ha'evan, the stone. Again, interesting. we got this stone, stone showing up again. So they got an excuse. We're being lazy because of this. He was still speaking with them when Rachel came with the flock, which was her father's, for she was a shepherdess, a ro'ah. And it was as Yaakov saw Rachel, Yaakov at Rachel, when he saw her, Bat Lavan, the daughter of Lavan, Achi Imo, the brother of his mother, Vet Son Lavan, and the, sh- the flock of Laban, Achi Imo, Vaigash Yaakov, that Nagash that he approached. There's a noon there, it's in the Gimel. Vayagel, and he was happy. Oh, pardon me, Galal. <laughs> I was thinking a different word. <laughs> like Hava Nagila, that one I was thinking. Gil, but it's actually Galal, the Lamed fell away. So he rolled Ha'evan, the stone. Me'al from upon the, the, literally the mouth of the Be'er, the mouth of the well. Vayashk, and he gave to drink the Tzon Lavan Achi Imo. Okay? Then something weird happens. This is the verb Nashach. So there's a noon inside there. Nashak is to kiss. A neshek is a kiss. Different from a neshek, which is a bite or interest on a loan. So then Yaakov kissed Rachel. What, what, what? He kissed her. I love the story, right? He kisses Rachel. And then what happens? Then he, Vayaged, oh, pardon me, oh, here it is. Vaisa, that's Nasa, like Nasa takes the rockets up. Vaisa, et kolo, he lifted up his voice. Vayevik! And he, <laughs> he wept. I'm not making fun of our ancestor. It's just, we're so far separated from the way that things were done back then and how culture was back then and all this stuff, right? So why did he weep, though? It still seems kind of odd, right? First that he kissed him and then he weeps. What's going on? So let's look at this uncovering the stone. What happened? According to Midrash Rabbah, they show this as an example of how strong Yaakov was. The, the shepherds are saying, we can't until the others show up to roll the stone, right? Because it takes many men to do it. And then Yaakov gets up there, da-da-da-da, and he rolls it himself, right? So maybe, maybe. Or it could just be that he's irritated, they're not working. He's like, look, I'm one guy and I can do it. It rolls. It's, it's round-like, okay? There's not a lot of friction. There's not a lot of static friction there, okay? We can overcome this. Hey, again, for you, Dwayne, the coefficient of static friction is low there. <laughs> and he lifted up his voice and wept. Okay, so what's with this weepy business? According to Midrash Beshit Rabbah, again, excellent Midrash, probably the best of the Midrashim. If you can only read one Midrash, I should say the most reliable. I Because the sages are sometimes, like, especially Ibn Ezra, Ibn Ezra is extremely suspicious of Midrash, right? He'll say, like, well, so-and-so says this, but that's just Midrash, right? Or, or they're engaging, those who say this are, quote, engaging in Midrash, right? So you can tell that he's kind of more, show me the grammar, man. You know, I want to see what's really happening. It's, it's in the text. Show me the grammar. But, as I mentioned before, Midrash Breshit Rabbah is actually canonized by, by Beta Israel, the, our Ethiopian Jewish brothers, right? So that particular sect of Judaism counted as scripture. Now, I'm not saying they're right. I don't think they're right, but I think that it does give us pause when 
we looked at Breshit Rabbah, that maybe there's some true stuff there, right? Maybe they know a little bit about what they're talking to. In the same way that we look at the book of Enoch, or Jubilees, right? These books that are quoted by apostolic writings, they quote directly from Enoch, right? And they quote from Jubilees, that maybe it's not to be canonized, but there's something real happening there. There's some real knowledge happening there. So in this case, he cried, because Ruach HaKodesh demonstrated to him that he would not be buried together with Rachel. Remember, she dies. She doesn't even get to be buried at Machpelah, right? Where his ancestors are. They have to bury her elsewhere. And Yaakov told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was the son of Rivka, and she ran and told her father. And it was in the morning, behold, okay, so this is fast forwarding. <laughs> so you know what happens. They have the marriage, right? And then Lavan, who's an evil SOB, he, he tricks our ancestor. He breaks, he violates the contract, and he puts another lady in there, right? The sister of Rachel, right? And it's dark in the tent. They don't have electricity back then. And so Yaakov's all happy. He got to sleep with his love, the one he's so in love with. And the next morning... He looks over, what, what, what? <laughs> somebody else. Can you imagine how horrible that'd be? You know, you think you're sleeping with the person you love, and then it's somebody else, right? Somebody else. You know, you, you, it was not meaningful. You know, you weren't in love with this person. You weren't committed to this person. At least you didn't think you were, but you were tricked. You tricked them. And this is actually why, to this day, in Jewish marriages, we check the veil. You know, lift up the veil and see. So you single guys out there, when you get married, make sure to lift up the veil. Check, see who's there. Okay, continuing on. So Laban says, look, 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 we just don't do that thing to give the younger before the older. Okay, like he couldn't have said that before. He's just trying to get weasel more work out of our ancestor, right? He's trying to get more work out of Fulfill this week. Why is it a week? Fulfill the week with Leah, he's saying, right? Because it is the tradition. There's the marriage week. The, the banquet lasted a whole week, right? This is where we get the Sheva Barachot today, the idea of seven blessings for the marriage and all that stuff. It comes from the ancient times. It was seven days. It's not seven days today anymore. Now it's just seven blessings, right? But it was seven days. So fulfill this week with Leah, right? Don't break her happiness, you know. Keep, keep spending time with her, right? Keep her as your wife. And then I'll give you Rachel immediately after the seven days. You get another marriage right away as long as you pay off the, another seven years, right? So Jacob agrees. And then we have all these sons and they're given the names. So, okay, Leah has a kid. His name's Reuven. Because Ra'a, right, God saw, so he gets a Ben, right? So Ra'a, Ben, you see that's where that name comes from. Although some say it's from Be'oni, God saw me in my Be'oni, you see the bait and the noon. He saw me in my suffering, right? Meaning that she's the one who's less loved, right? It's interesting, because of what happened to Jacob, I believe this is the reason that in the Torah there's a commandment that if a man is to take more than one wife, he cannot marry sisters, He's not supposed to take sisters and make them, again, another evidence that the Torah was not revealed fully yet, right? Because otherwise, Yaakov would have said, no, that's not allowed. I can't be with Rachel now. You already made me marry Leah. I'm not allowed to have a sister, as, as an actual sister, as the wife, right? But the Torah had not been fully revealed, so it was not a sin for Jacob to, to have sisters as wives, right? And, of course, we see how they suffer. They compete against each other, right? They're sisters. Right, and you know Leah really suffers because she's the one that is senua. She's less loved. Now she gives this. She gets a son. She says, "Certainly he will love me now." We can't read that without thinking about the wedding banquet of the lamb. And I'm winding up. Stick with me. I just have two or three more slides, and we're done. I just want to read this. This is my translation from the Greek, from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heavens will be like ten virgins who each take their lamps and go out to meet the groom. Okay, so you got these ten virgins. They're going to marry the same guy. They're waiting for him. Verse 8, 2, five of them were foolish, but five of them had, they had bina, understanding, or da'at. The foolish ones take their lamps, not having them with oil. So what does the oil represent in their lamps? Who knows what the oil is symbolic of? And don't say Holy Spirit. This is a goyish, uh, silly interpretation. It's not, it's not the whole it's not the Holy Spirit. What's what are they? What's the oil represent in lamps? What was the oil in the menorah in the temple? What was that about? 
The Shem in the oil represents the Torah, the law of God, the covenant with God, and the result of the covenant in keeping the Torah, speaking God's love language. So the foolish ones, they did not have oil. I believe this is the Goyesha church today, right? The Gentiles who have not decided to be grafted in but wanted to remain outside of the commonwealth, the politia, as the Greek says, of Israel. They have not joined us, they, which means they're not following the rules of the kingdom, which means they're not good citizens, okay? I think it might be these foolish ones, okay? Maybe. Some will make it through still because they truly do love Messiah and they just don't know any better, right? But those who willingly ignore the truth, it's dangerous for them. While the understanding ones take olive oil, Torah, in a flash with their lamps. While the groom was delayed, they all became sleepy and dozed off. In the middle of the night, there was a cry. Yallah! It wasn't Allahu Akbar. It wasn't that. Behold, the groom come out greeting him. Then all those virgins who put their lamps in order awoke. Because here comes the groom. But the foolish ones said to the knowledgeable ones, Give us some of your oil. Because our lamps have gone out. The knowledgeable ones, however, answered, saying, Perhaps there will not be enough for us and you. Instead, go yourselves to the cellars and buy for yourselves. So they left to buy for themselves. Then the groom arrived, and those ladies who were prepared departed with him to the wedding celebration, and the door was shut. There comes a time, Rebel Tai, if you've been convinced about what is the right way and you still won't walk on that way, it's not there forever for you. The door will be closed. Later, the rest of the virgin brides arrive saying, Oh, husband, oh, husband, open up for us. But he answered saying, Truly, I say to you, I don't know you. Ouch. Be wakeful then, for you do not know the day or the hour. So let's look at this, the kingdom of heavens. We're reminded of the Jewishness of the account as Yeshua refrains from using the actual name of God, right? The kingdom of heavens, the Machut HaShemayim, this is referring to God the Father. This is one way that referred him without saying his name. You remember, the Messiah never once pronounced God's name in any recorded scripture, right? He does not, that's why it's so funny today, people running around, oh, yeah, hey, Wow, hey, and they're trying to say the name, and they have different ways to say the name, and they have different, you know, you got like that idiot, Nehemiah Gordon, who doesn't know what he's talking about, he's misleading people, doesn't believe in the Messiah, but for some reason Christians love him, you know, and he's, <laughs> he's telling them, oh, it's Yeho, and then the second part he says is Va, which is just impossible linguistically, because it was a wow, it's not a Vav, you have all these other people showing up, and they're trying to convince people to say the name, the Messiah himself did not say the name. So, you got, again, you got your WWJD bracelet on. What would Jesus do? He wouldn't say God's name, okay? Because he doesn't. And he, he even is very careful to use these, these uh, um, divine epithets, the kingdom of heaven, to refer to God. <clears throat> the groom was delayed. This is about the Messiah, right? We all will be married to Mashiach, right? The, the whole Kehillah, right? It's, it's not marriage like we think of today, but it's symbolic. It's metaphor, right? to be married to the groom, right? We're all these virgins who are going to marry this guy, uh, but we hopefully have our lamps filled with Torah, right? We're, we're studying scripture. We care to speak the love language of the groom. And he's delayed. Do you think it's fair to say that in history, anybody has thought that the groom has been delayed these last 2,000 years? Absolutely. Anima amin, anima amin, be'emun ashelema, right? The words of that song are quite great. I believe even though the Messiah tarries, that he's still coming, right? And we would say, he's still going to come back, even though it's been a while. They all became sleepy. This is interesting. Is anybody sleepy now, after hearing me talk for two hours? <laughs> Don't fall asleep. And then this, be wakeful then, for you do not know the day or the hour. This is Greek word, Gregoreo, to stay awake, to be watchful, to be in constant readiness, be on the alert. Remain fully alive. Be alive. I don't have time to go into this Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's interesting. We have a similar thing in this conduct for the community from the Dead Sea Scrolls found in Cave 1 at Qumran. And it's basically saying that in their community, they had this rule that at all times, someone should be studying Torah, right? Aloud, muttering, like it says in Psalm 1, that the righteous man mumbles the Torah day and night, right? So there were people assigned on night watch, even, to say the Torah, and this was this yishkodu, right, to gregoreo, to stay wakeful and alertful. And shakad, it's basically a synonym of shamar, right? 
and that they would all together can make sure to be saying the Torah at all times. There's always someone every hour of the day assigned to be reading from the Torah to protect the community. What the enemy intends for evil. <clears throat> and then she became pregnant again and birthed a son. And she said, because Adonai has heard, remember I said to say the Asher Shemez, right, Tefillah, when you get something answered, that I am loved less, right, it's not that I'm hated, it's the Nuah, that I'm loved less. <clears throat> he has given me also this one, right? So Leah keeps birthing. So she called his name Shimon. Shimon, right? Look, it's related to Shema, right? She says, Ki Shema Adonai. I'll call him Shimon. You see? Do you see the connection? The play on words is happening in the Hebrew. In English, it would have made more sense. Because Adonai has heard, I will call him Herdy. Right, so something like that, or heard on, you know, or whatever. Hearing, I'll call him hearing, you know, something like that. And he says, Yeshua's delay gives us time for tikkun and teshuvah. Amen. Good point. It's good that he's delayed, so that more people can come in, and that we can also work on correcting the world, making the world better, helping people, helping animals, letting his Torah shine out through us, and correct our own stuff, work on our own midot. Nice point. She then became pregnant again and birthed a son. And she said, Now this time my husband will join himself to me, for I have borne him three sons. I don't know why she's a southern belle, but let's just roll with it. So here we have the play on words. Look, Yilave, so she calls him Lewi. Look, Yilave, Lewi. That's what these words were. So you can see the, you see the connection? She likes to do the play on words. I have some more stuff here in Arabic and Ugaritic about Shimon, but we don't have time. If you like those notes, take a look. Good. So, Yilawe meant he will join himself. And so the child's name is Lewi, like joiner, right? So if we made the English more like the Hebrew, we'd say, he will join himself to me. So she called him joiner, right? Something like that. Then she became pregnant again and birthed a son. And she said, this time, I will thank God on I. And she called his name Yehuda. Then she stopped giving birth. Okay. So Yehuda, oh wait, where, why don't I have a note on Hapam? Hapam is like a stride or step. Remember I mentioned last time that when Esau is complaining, the wicked Esau is complaining about our ancestor, and he says, like, it's true that he is called Yaakov, like healer, one who got the heal, because he's healed me these two pa'amim, these pa'amayim, these two strides. Right, so palm is step, pace, iteration, or time. And so we follow Ibn Ezra's interpretation that it's this time here. This time, I will thank Adonai. So Yehuda, you can see it's close to Toda, right? You have this, this real related thing in here. All right. Almost finished. Well, look at that. We are finished. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Two hours, seven minutes, not too long. I told you. I said, Bli Nether, I promise you we'll be done. We'll finish by seven. It's 6.54. Baruch Hashem, look at that. <laughs> Let's see, Esau says, it's amazing how a lot of the names in ancient times are based on current events and personal experiences. Yeah, I was just thinking about that a couple weeks ago. Esau, I agree. It is interesting, right? Like, like, have you ever thought to name your own children? Like, you know, like... Job found, right? You know, someone calls their kid, job, new job found, right? Or increase, for God has increased my paycheck. Or, you know, or you can maybe na name your kid like, you know, like China stinks because they gave us COVID, right? That's the kid's name. You know, it's like, or whatever. Janine says, I suppose the concept of children of bond women doesn't apply to some of the sons of, of Yaakov here as in Ishmael's case. Yeah, there's an interesting relationship with Jacob's third and fourth wives, right? Because they had this strange status of belonging to the other wives, right? I mean, Rachel even says, you know, uh, she'll give birth on my knees and through her I'll build up my household, right? And I think it's really reflective of the yearning that, that God puts in women to have children, to give children to their husbands, right? To, and to raise up children, right? The spiritual need they have to give, to give, to give. Right, to give to another being, even all of yourself, 
right, to even sacrifice, right, not eating certain foods so that the child can have the food or whatever, that this is something that God has put inside of woman so that, so that if she's not able to give birth, she still wants to have a child that's from that man that she can connect to, right, that she can help to rear up. And I think that's what we see, especially with the case of Rachel. And then later, it seems like Leah is just copying her. But I want to point out something. Jews today, we're from Leah. Most of us are from Leah. So it's kind of interesting. So if you find yourself in some kind of situation, maybe the relationship isn't what you hoped it would be, right? Maybe Hollywood had polluted your head with romance and what a marriage is supposed to be and all this stuff. But then you're, you're not so happy with your certain situ- situation. Maybe it's not everything crack- it was cracked up to be. Remember, divorce is not an option, right, for believers. Divorce is only an option in certain situations. Only certain situations, right? If you've been divorced in the past, and look, you can't go back and fix everything, right? We make tissue bond, and that's it. But I'm saying the optimal case is to remain with that person, right? And so what do you think in the case of Alea? She was like the surprise wife. Can you imagine? He wakes up in the morning, she's like, surprise! <laughs> He's like, what? Who are you? <laughs> imagine how hard that was for her. But out of that painful situation... We have Judah today and Levi. Most people today, who, if, if you go somewhere and you go to the Jewish community and someone, if they're not a convert, right, they're from Judah or Levi, right? 8% of Jews today are Levi, and the most of us, the most of the rest of us are Judah, right? And that's from Leah. Rachel's not our mother. Leah is the one who had to suffer. So, and the scepter doesn't pass from Judah, and the Mashiach comes from Judah. So whatever your suffering is, in your situation, in your, your relationship, or whatever it is, God can really use that and bring great things out of that if you just subject yourself to his will and you're willing to, to still be the best that you can be in whatever that situation is. And we see it through the amazing miracle that most of us were from Leah. You know, it's like, and so even though she wasn't the chosen one, she was Tanua, she wasn't the one that he loved the most. Out of all four of Jacob's wives, nevertheless, great things came from her. And that can also be a nice metaphor. It doesn't have to be marriage. It can be whatever your situation, right? You're in a bad situation, and maybe you think, why is God doing this to me? Like I mentioned before, why is he making me suffer through this horrible job or suffer with these terrible in-laws or suffer, suffer with this terrible neighbor or terrible sibling or, or terrible parent, right, or whatever it is? If you behave righteously, he can still use that for great things. It wasn't good for Jacob to have the woman he didn't want. And it wasn't good for Leah to be unwanted, right? But nevertheless, it worked out. And from that, great things have happened. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Esau says, I, I'll name my next son Kovac when I COVID vaccine is finally out. <laughs> Do it in Hebrew, though. <laughs> and Natalie says, Rabbi Jeremiah, where was Rachel that night when Jacob slept with Leah? Well, we have various traditions about it, right? It probably was very hard for her to have to wait. You know, she knew what's going to happen. We have this one tradition as a midrash that that uh, she had certain signals she could do that she was doing to Leah. She was actually helping her sister with certain signals outside the tent to how to communicate to Jacob and all this stuff. You know, so I'm not sure if, if those midrashes are correct or not. If it's true, uh, really, it's a mystery. We don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> is it Annie or Anthony? <laughs> A10. I don't know which one that is. <laughs> one of the 10 says tied up. She was tied up so she couldn't. That's my man. That's my husband. <laughs> you know, I saw him first. Janine says, by the way, on a different note, it's hilarious, Rob, when you mimic women <laughs> in your illustrations. Thank you. I'm glad you appreciate that. <laughs> women sound particularly funny in Hebrew, I think, when they're speaking Hebrew. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and close it because we're right at 7. Avinu um, Makenu, our Father, our King. Toda lecha lechol tamul dai. Kenya atron ki tish lach alehem bevakasha Adonai. Refuot shalemot, beberachot mishamay mimaal. Vechol tov asher yesh lecha lahem. Father, just ask that for all of our students that you would send forth your blessings and, and that you would give them complete healings from any kind of thing that's ailing them, and that you would also give them blessings from your heavens above. Okay, Shavuot Tov. Bessie says, will we again for Hebrew class 
Get your ten together. Shake up those students. <laughs> shake them, shake them, Bessie. Shake them. Shake them, shake them. 